and it's 11 o'clock. So uh, it's Wednesday, the 10th of March, uh, 11 o'clock, and this is a virtual meeting of the Planning Committee. I would like to welcome everyone to this virtual meeting of the Planning Committee. My name is uh, Councillor Matt McCabe and I am the Chair of the Committee. And I will now call out the names of the other members of the committee who will be making the decisions today and ask them to confirm that they are present. Uh, Councillor Vic Clark. Present. Councillor Sue Craig. Present. Councillor Sally Davis. Present. Councillor Lucy Hodge. Present. Councillor Duncan Hounsell. Present. Councillor Sean Hughes. Present. Councillor Eleanor Jackson. Present. Councillor Hal McPhee. Present. And Councillor Amanda Rigby. Present. Uh, also present are Simon Barnes, our legal advisor, Richard Stott, our team manager uh, from planning and enforcement, and Marie Todd, the democratic services officer. Uh, the planning case officers are also in attendance to present their reports and answer questions along the way, and I will introduce them uh, when, they, uh, when they appear. And we also have the highways officer, Darren Cox. So this meeting is being held under the coronavirus regulations 2020 and has the same status and validity as a meeting held at the Guild Hall. Uh, the following applications will be considered in the morning session of the meeting, and that's Canesham Conservative Club, uh, 30A Lincoln Hill, and the Friends Meeting House, York Street, Bath. And the following application will be considered in the afternoon session of the meeting at 2 p.m. And that's 143 Carlton Road, Lincoln, uh, and the application for Crewcroft Barn, which appeared on the agenda, Hinton Charterhouse has now been withdrawn uh, from this agenda and will be uh, returning for the April meeting. Uh, I don't think there's any apologies or absences and substitutions, is there, Marie? No, no, no apologies, Chair. Okay, uh, declarations of interest. Uh, I have two indications, one Councillor Sue Craig. Thank you, Chair. Um, Friends Meeting House application, I'll be speaking uh, in support of the applicant as ward councillor, so I won't be taking part in the vote on that one. Thank you very much. And Councillor Sally Davis. Uh, just to clarify, the first and second item, Kenshin Conservative Club, it's not the same as the Conservative Party. And although both Councillor Clark and myself are members of the Conservative Party, we're not members of the Conservative Club. Thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, there is no urgent business, um, so can I ask the Democratic Services Officer to now inform our public speakers of the procedure they should follow? Thank you, Chair. Members of the public have registered to speak about individual planning applications on the agenda. Ward councillors not on the committee have also indicated they wish to speak about applications. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentation about the application. The order of speakers and the time allowed for speaking will be as follows. Objectors to an application will be allowed three minutes in total per application. Supporters of an application will be allowed three minutes in total per application. If there is more than one objector or supporter of an application, they must share the three minutes allowed to each side. Ward councillors not on the committee who have indicated they wish to speak about an application may do so for a maximum of five minutes per application. I will time the speeches and inform the chair using the chat function when the time is up. The chair will then ask speakers to immediately conclude their remarks. After making their statement, speakers will remain in the meeting so they can observe the debate. However, they have no further right to speak and so should mute their microphone and switch off their video. They should not make any comment using the chat function. Once their item has finished, speakers will be removed from Zoom and can view the rest of the meeting on YouTube if they wish. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. Um, the minutes of the previous meeting have been circulated and I see that Councillor Jackson is willing to propose that they are correct, and Councillor is, is waving at me to uh, hopefully second uh, that. So I will sign those uh, uh, as soon as uh, we're allowed to gather uh, together again. So we move to the main plans list, and our first item today, items one and two, uh, is the Canesham Conservative Club, 22 High Street, Canesham. Uh, and can I invite the case officer, Caroline Power, to present her report? We 
can see your screen, that's good. Hopefully you can hear me. And we can hear you as well. Well done. Fantastic. <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. And thank you for um, listening to, to me over this, the course of the next uh, three separate applications. Um, so uh, the first one we're looking at today is um, for the installation of four replacement sash windows on the upper story of the front elevation at Canesham Conservative Club, which is at 22 High Street, Canesham. We have two applications, one for listed building uh, consent and one for planning permission on this one. As you can see, uh, the, the site is at the top end of the High Street um, and in a, a very sensitive part of Canesham. The building in question is grade two. It's a listed um, 18th century property, we believe, probably built originally as a residential townhouse and therefore carrying considerable status within the town at that time and presently does the same. Um, its front elevation is immediately onto the back of the pavement in full view within the public domain. And it has been the conservative club or headquarters for at least 100 years, if not more. The plan uh, in front of you is from our conservation area character appraisal that was adopted in 2016. And um, sorry, it's a little bit faint, but the um, building we're considering today is at the top um, part of the plan and shows how close it is to other quite uh, major historic uh, assets within the town centre, including the uh, remains of the abbey and the parish church. So it's in a very important historic sort of core of the town. As you can see from this uh, plan, which shows the existing situation with the um, unauthorised plastic windows fitted, the um, property has quite an unusual uh, visual appearance. It's not uh, the normal symmetrical 18th century facade that you would expect. Um, although the ground floor is relatively straightforward with the three six, um, eight over eight sash windows. On the first floor, we have one eight over say, eight sash window of the same size and proportion and then three smaller ones which are six over six um, with uh, obviously the glazing bars would have been um, traditional through glazing bars on on these sash windows prior to the removal of them in 28 2019 i believe uh, when the building was refurbished and redecorated the proposal is to replace those four UPVC uh, windows, which have previously been refused. Um, members will note um, in the report, uh, so the list of building application in 2019 that was submitted was refused. Um, and as a result of that, the applicants have seen uh, the need to uh, get authorization for the windows and are now proposing to replace those plastic windows with um, timber sash. Um, the only difference between those and the ground floor will be that these will be double glazed. And here is a more detailed plan showing the comparison between the two types of windows we'll have installed if you approve this scheme. In other words, the, the ground floor windows will remain a single glazed with a traditional lamb's tongue molding through glazing bar between the glass panes. And on the first floor, these will be replicated moldings, but with a double uh, um, glazed uh, panes. 
um, as as the applicants have now realised that the UPVC double glazed units that they put in do give them a certain amount of um, draft uh, and uh, noise insulation. So that has been an uh, improvement in their eyes and they want to continue with that with these replacements. Uh, one thing that was picked up by um, councillor yesterday in the briefing was that in my report I mentioned um, that the design guide um, has um, in preparation um, and uh, I just wanted to clarify that that is a, um, a design guide that's been prepared between Canesham Town Council and Historic England, uh, probably through the Heritage Action Zone that has recently been um, implemented in that area of Canesham. And it's part of the overall neighbourhood plan, as uh, we thought, uh, which um, was um, basically discussed um, at the Town Council's meeting in September last year. Um, but now the Heritage Action Plan has been um, formally started, if you like, um, with a project manager in, in place. Um, we believe that that will be coming through in a more um, proactive way through the master planning that they're doing at the moment. Um, this, sorry, I've, can you still see me? You, you seem to have switched off your screen sharing. <laughs> I didn't switch it off, it just disappeared, oh. sorry. Uh, are we back? No, you may I'm have talking to... too much. <laughs> you may have to start um, so, again. So just to show you um, some photographs of the site quickly. Um, this is a pre... We can't, we can't see a thing. Oh, I'm sorry. You'll need to start, start again with yeah, screen sharing. I'll come back to you. And now we can see you. Okay, I'll just start again, sorry. There we go, yes. Can you see that now? Uh, yes, lovely. Hurrah. Okay, so this is a, just a photograph to show you um, what the building looked like prior to the um, unauthorised windows being installed. Um, and you can just, I'm afraid it's not a very good quality one and it's black and white, but it does show the fine detailing of the mid rails of the sashes on the on the upper story um, and how they relate to the lower story um, and just to show you now um, this is the present situation with as you can see thicker uh, mid rails on the uh, sash windows at the top compared with the ground floor here's another one and then a closer up um, look which actually shows that these glazing bars are actually stuck um, in the um, sort of center of the two panes of glass. So they're actually uh, not proper glazing bars at all. So just to summarize, um, it's considered that the proposal to in install four uh, timber double glazed sash windows with traditional through glazing bars closely resembling the ground floor windows is an acceptable solution and will not only preserve the significance of this listed building, but will also improve the setting of the adjacent heritage assets and enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you could just end screen sharing and I can see my chat box again. Uh, and then we move on to quest questions for the officer. Uh, do we have any questions for the officer? No. I, I'm looking for waving hands or anything. I think anything. you have a speaker. Do you have a speaker? Uh, oh, hang on. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Sally. Yes. I seem to have forgotten what to do. Uh, ah, there we go. My, my, my script has come back. Uh, so we have a public speaker and that's Dave. Dave Johnson, uh, are you there, Mr. Johnson? Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, in we did, indeed we can, and I believe, uh, yes, you're speaking uh, as the applicant, so off you right, go. Yeah. Okay? Yep. Okay, yes, I'm the secretary, actually, of the uh, Kingsman District Conservative Club. Okay, um, during refurbishment of the club in the spring of 2019, we were informed by our contractor 
that the wooden windows at the front, eleva front first floor elevation were rotten and needed replacing. As the scaffolding was in place, we hurriedly replaced them with matching PVC windows, which substantially reduced our heating costs. Following a complaint from a member of the general public, Bain's uh, planning department advised us that they contravened planning and listed building regulations. We submitted two proposals from timber window manufacturers to the planning department for consideration of vice. One was rejected immediately, being of insufficient standard, the other falling short on detail. After protracted discussions lasting more than a year between the planning department and the supplier, who ironically installed the existing window some 25 years previously, and who is on the council's approved timber window supplier list, we understand agreement was reached on the drawings and specification to comply with planning and listed building requirements. These form the basis of our application, which is before you, which we hope will receive committee approval so that we can move forward and leave this sorry saga behind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Right, I'm back, uh, uh, back on board now. Um, so questions for the officer, uh, council, uh, oh, we've, got no, we've got no questions for the officer. Can I then, oh no, we have Councillor Hodge. Yes. Just more, one small question for Caroline. You feel very positive about the, the new windows. Um, are they, I just wondered, have they managed to achieve slimline argon filled double glazing? Um, it, and they've retained the lamb's tongue detailing, which is great. And you, you can, I don't know whether it is it slimline or I think you can do it with a six mil gap um, and argon fill, but is, is that not possible with the, the through glazing bar? Um, um, yes, I believe the um, joiners have said that they can achieve that, which is okay. unusual uh, yeah. given the how many you know glazing bars we've got on this one, and it will be quite a pricey ent enterprise to do. But um, we have got confidence that they can achieve this. Great. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. So, if there's any no more questions for the officer, can I invite? Councillor Clark as the ward councillor to open the debate, please. Yeah, hi there. Um, uh, I'm not aware of any objections to what seems to me a very sensible solution as a result of the ongoing discussions uh, between the applicant, the officers, and obviously the um, suppliers. So it does seem to me to be a solution uh, which might benefit other um, local listed buildings um, and therefore, I have no hesitation in supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Are you moving a motion to support the officer's recommendation? I, I will indeed. I think that might be a it good will. idea. OK, jolly good. And I'm looking for a seconder. Um, Councillor Jackson, you're down to speak. Oh, Councillor McPhee has raised his hand uh, to second. Um, uh, Councillor Jackson. Well, I thought I got in first, but never mind. Uh, I mean, the reason why I'm very keen to speak is that I think this is an excellent solution to the problem, and I would have would have seconded the motion. Um, uh, in all seriousness, we can see that this will greatly conserve and enhance the conservation area and the impact on the street, uh, which is, after all, um, for people going up and down the high street, the most important thing. Um, will be considerably improved. Um, and I, I practice what I preach in that I had two of the windows of this little miner's cottage, uh, which of course won't be listed, uh, replaced with this type of original sash window. And it, it's made a huge difference to the appearance and the double glazing to my heating bills. So I, I thoroughly support this application. Does anybody else want to comment uh, or we move to a vote? Uh, are you happy to, um, Vic, you, were you happy to propose both for the planning consent and the listed? Because we need to take two votes. Are you happy to? You're taking the words out of my mouth, Matt. Lovely. <laughs> and uh, how are you happy to second both? Although what I should maybe maybe offer Councillor Jackson the opportunity to yeah. second this. <laughs> so, OK, well, I'll, uh, uh, we'll take Councillor Jackson seconding the listed building's consent. Um, so, uh, we will go through, first of all, for the planning consent uh, to uh, the motion is to support the officer's recommendation to permit. Uh, and uh, I'll go in alphabetical order, starting with Councillor Clark. Four. Four. Councillor Craig. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Hodge. Four. Councillor Hounsell. Four. Councillor Jackson. Four. 
Councillor Hughes. For. Councillor McPhee. For. Councillor McCabe for. Councillor Rigby. For. And uh, I'll go in reverse order for the list of buildings consent. Councillor Rigby. For. Councillor McCabe for. Councillor McPhee. For. Councillor Jackson. For. Councillor Hughes. For. Councillor Hounsall. For. Councillor Hodge. For. Councillor Davis. For. Councillor Craig. For. Councillor Clark. For. Uh, so both votes are unanimous uh, in favour of supporting the officer's uh, recommendation to permit. Uh, and I hope uh, I hope the work goes well, Mr. Johnson. I hope uh, you will be uh, somewhere that can uh, eventually show off what you have achieved in terms of uh, double glazing a, a, a listed building. And thank you for coming in uh, and for contributing. So uh, the next item on the agenda is 30A Lincoln Hill Bath. And Caroline, are you still there as the case officer? I am. Good. There we go. Hope you're seeing my screen again. We are, thank you. I'm just uh, having to catch up on my other side, <laughs> my other PC. Right. <clears throat> so um, this application relates to a planning application for the erection of a mansard roof with living accommodation within it um, and um, a small demolition to the side of the house um, at 30A Lincoln Hill in Lincoln, Bath. This is um, just a, a, a plan from the application showing a red line around the actual um, application site um, and as you can see it's in a within a wider area um, also highlighted in blue um, because the owners of the adjacent property known as Abbey Lodge or number 30 Lincoln Hill uh, actually also own 30A so um, just uh, bear that in mind because of the close relationship um, visually between the two buildings when you look at the details uh, obviously, the site is also within the conservation area and World Heritage Site. This is a picture of the um, building. As you can see, it's quite um, a modest looking single story structure built of stone with modern aluminium windows and doors. Um, I'm afraid I don't have a pointer on this particular um, iPad. To show you but the, the smaller building with a single window in at the top um, sorry on the how would it how would you see it on on the upper side of the of the photograph on the left hand side would it be um, was believed to be a garage when it was first constructed and you'll see more information about that in due course Um, on plan, this is the existing uh, elevation from that same view, showing the, as I said, there's a very close relationship between Abbey Lodge and this property 30A, Lincoln Hill. On the other side, which is the west elevation, this is a photograph showing the building in its uh, current condition. Um, when I first saw it, it did have a flat roof on that first section of the building, um, which has also got the entrance to the uh, rest of that building uh, from a courtyard, um, but that is um, proposed to be changed in this proposal. 
Um, you can also see in this photograph, there is um, uh, the other side of this uh, structure. So Abbey Lodge is on one side and then the other side is the end uh, of a terrace called Oxford Terrace, which are also grade two listed as well as Abbey Lodge. And um, the existing plan showing those buildings together. Uh, this is a, a section of the south elevation at the moment. And as you can see, um, one of the things I'd like you to be bear in mind is are uh, there's two windows um, on the first floor of Abbey Lodge that uh, overlook, if you like, this part of the site. Uh, this is um, a photograph which actually shows those two windows in quite clear, clearly uh, visible from uh, <clears throat> the upper story of um, Abbey Lodge. There is a sort of um, fan light below that, which um, as part of the previous um, applications on Abbey Lodge itself would be uh, formed into a door opening and, and partly obscured. Um, to create an, a utility space within part of 30A for Abbey Lodge, but I'll show you that in more detail in a minute. This photograph also helps to show you the garage, which was built onto the side of 30A, which actually now forms um, a sort of continuous development between the two structures and atta is attached to the end of Oxford Terrace. Um, and this garage, so say, <clears throat> although we've got no real sort of um, photographic evidence of it, was clearly converted at some time in the recent past to another bedroom for uh, 30A. So it's a two bedroom dwelling. Uh, and these plans of the existing ground floor show that. Um, as you can see, there's a small dining room kitchen um, in the western end of it, of the structure, where the front door used to be, or still is for the moment. And that then led into a lounge. And then off the lounge were these two bedrooms and a small bathroom. Uh, obviously it didn't have any first floor. It was flat roofed. And then that's the roof plan. Just to give you a little bit more context to this, um, sorry, just bear with me while I catch up um, with my notes. Um, so this is a view of Abbey Lodge of its Eastern elevation taken from the garden, which um, is a steeply sloping garden and slopes right down to Lincoln Hill. Um, as you can see, it's a Tudor Beetham as it's called in the, uh, listing and um, is um, characterized by these um, crenellations at the top uh, on the parapet wall, wall of the roof. Um, and it was quite a, an interesting and distinctive building of its own, um, quite different in character from the terrace, Oxford Terrace, which was obviously built at an early, slightly earlier time than um, Abbey Lodge itself. Um, the plans for the site, um, this is from 1880, this map, 1882, sorry, um, shows the um, Abbey Lodge or Abbey Ville, as it was called in those days, um, within its own very uh, sort of distinct um, sort of garden space um, with nothing surrounding it except um, garden structures at that time. And you can just see at the um, bottom of that map, the end of Oxford Terrace coming into view. Slightly later map from 1904 shows how the um, Abbey Lodge was beginning to be added to. Um, so it, if we go back to the photograph, you'll see that um, there were additions added on in a sort of rather sort of haphazard fashion in terms of when they were added. Um, but we understand that those were sort of service wings that were added at a later date. 
this photograph also um, by being <laughs> the vegetation shows um, that just over the top of it to one side is the top of the roof at the pres present moment of 30A. But it's very difficult to see in that photograph. Moving on, this is the uh, front elevation of Oxford Terrace. Um, this photograph is taken obviously in their garden um, and this is number 32. Uh, so this is the, the property that will be, is physically attached at the moment to 30A by uh, means of the garage. Um, <clears throat> and members should also be aware that last year uh, when we, we considered the first of, of the applications to put a mansard roof on 30A, we also at the same time looked at um, the demolition of the garage infill um, uh, through a list of building application and that was approved. So um, the applicants presently have permission to remove the garage uh, structure from the site. But you can also see in this photograph how limited the actual impact is at the moment of the height of the current structure known as 30A on both those buildings. And this is to remind you of what it looks like and how um, that building then relates to the extension at um, Abbey Lodge. This is the proposed uh, block plan for the scheme showing uh, the, in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to the way the um, garden is proposed to be uh, severed from Abbey Lodge. Indeed, when you go uh, to the site, you'll see that the um, unit that we believe 30A was built in around 1950. And at that time, the garden belonging to Abbey Lodge was actually fragmented and uh, divided off to allow a, gar a separate garden for this unit. Um, so there are still some signs of uh, fencing, vegetation, shrubbery. Um, we also know um, that the um, unit would have shared the uh, pedestrian access onto Lincoln Hill. As you can see in, in the um, plan there, there is a, 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 an opening. I'll show you a photograph shortly of that pedestrian access. And um, we do believe that uh, 30A would have used it as well. This is a proposed uh, elevation of the um, property with its slightly reduced mansard roof. Um, the lines, the red lines show the previous scheme that we've refused uh, with a slightly higher uh, mansard roof. It's about 0.3 of a metre higher than the proposal is at the moment before you. You'll also notice that in the area where the garage has been, the proposal is to add um, a garage, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, a cycle store and a refuse store. And this is in um, more context, again, showing the adjacent listed buildings. This is the back of the building showing uh, what it will look like with the um, proposed mansard and dormers. Um, you'll notice there is a door on this elevation, but it will be actually um, an access point for the Abbey Lodge, um, who will turn part of that, convert part of that building into a utility space for the, the um, lodge itself. And that is, um, again, more for context, seeing the buildings in their um, true situation. On the side elevation, which is going to become the main front door for 30A, you can see here how the uh, new roof will partially obscure the windows to the um, Abbey Lodge itself. And you'll also see, sorry, 
the uh, new storage areas for bikes and refuge. Uh, these weren't proposed in the previous scheme. And uh, in order to create this uh, mezzanine level for the, the um, bedrooms, the uh, applicants are proposing to um, basically uh, dig down into the ground and lower the floor and footprint of um, floor floor of the uh, unit in order to uh, get the um, necessary height for the ground floor. On plan then, uh, what we have is uh, quite an open spaced um, uh, living and kitchen area within the new unit, um, which um, is obviously, you know, the way people want to live these days, <laughs> quite understandably. You'll also notice on this plan, uh, the red area is the um, proposed uh, utility space for Abbey Lodge, which, as I said, got permission to do that in 2017 when we did, dealt with the proposals for Abbey Lodge itself at that time. And this shows the first floor with the two bedrooms and two ensuite. And on the roof itself, the proposal is to fit some volta, photovoltaic, uh, uh, um, sorry, I've lost my plot, uh, photovoltaics to actually provide energy for this particular unit. This again, wasn't proposed in the previous scheme. This is a view of the uh, route um, at the back of Oxford Terrace. Um, it's a small driveway or, and it's quite narrow, uh, linking the um, Abbey Lodge to Lincoln Hill. And the courtyard in front of 30A there is used by the owners of Abbey Lodge for their cars. This is the pedestrian access that I was telling you about, um, which is directly onto Lincoln Hill. Um, the, the walls and gate piers are listed separately, grade two. And you can just make out in the photograph um, some steps inside the, the gate piers, which we believe was the access point for the um, use, residential uh, users of uh, 30A. This is a view just uh, within the street at uh, Lincoln Hill, just outside the site, showing the sort of uh, type of parking that's going on out there. Um, it's all um, permit holder parking. Uh, I think the car on the left is unauthorized parking. Um, and then we've got some visual impact assessment um, work that's been done by the applicant and these are the updated versions I should have said at the start um, in your update report you'll see that the um, Preservation Trust have provided some very comprehensive comments on the scheme. Uh, one of the things they requested was that the applicants provide an updated visual impact assessment for the proposals uh, which they have now done and you'll be looking at these uh, over the next four slides with me. Um, I also want to point out that the update report also included um, the neighbours comments in full um, because there's some um, concern that their uh, comments were treated as an objection, um, which to a certain extent they were because they actually filled in um, the, uh, their comments saying it was an objection. Um, but it's in, down to interpretation um, how they how you see what they say. So it, it, they're just printed in full for your consideration. Um, here you see the existing um, property on the hill um, from some distance. Uh, Abbey Lodge is clearly um, visible and then the end of Abbey um, Oxford Terrace. The horizontal white line in that photograph is actually a building that already exists within the grounds of Abbey Lodge. It's got a lean-to roof and it catches the sun. 
And so it does come out quite strongly in these photographs, but it's actually not, it's immediately behind uh, 30A, but it's not part of this application. Uh, here you'll see what uh, the proposed um, new mansard roof would look like. And this is a closer shot. Again, it does bring out the lean-to roof on the um, sort of small outbuilding that's um, way back <laughs> within the grounds of Abbey Lodge. And it's because it's up a hill, it's, it comes out higher. Um, and this shows the proposed um, at, uh, mansard roof. So to summarize, whilst we acknowledge that the height of this addition has been reduced and it is considered that design and scale of the mansard roof and the proposed dormers appear awkward, especially in the mansard roof's unresolved relationship to the gable end of the 1880s extension to Abbey Lodge and the partial obscuring of two windows on its south elevation. The steep profile of this roof addition with its sheer sides in contrast to the more conventional form of historic mansard roofs of a softer scale and verticality, together with this, the dis disproportionately sized dormers on the east elevation res will result in an incongruous addition to this dwelling. In addition, overly large windows and door openings at ground floor on the front elevation would be disproportionately large in direct conflict with the proportions of the existing fenestration of Abbey Lodge. Officers consider that the existing single storey unit is presently a discreet and relatively inconspicuous structure with a simple and unassuming presence. Modest, but both architecturally and in scale, it sits respectfully between the two listed assets. The proposal, however, will reverse the situation, making the unit more dominant, thereby creating a terracing effect, forming a continuous line of development, detrimentally impacting on the, on the separation and unique detached character of Abbey Lodge in particular, removing the sense of spaciousness that the lodge was designed to sit within historically. As a result, it is the officer's view that the scheme will result in less than substantial harm to the setting of the adjacent listed buildings, to the character and appearance of the conservation area, and to the outstanding universal value of the World Heritage Site. In such circumstances, paragraph 196 of the MPPF requires that any harm be weighed against public benefits of the proposal, including securing the optimum viable use of the building. MPF Sorry, it states that where a development proposal leads to less than substantial harm, the, the harm should be weighed against public benefits. In officers' views, there are no public benefits associated with this scheme, and the benefits are private to the owners of the building. There is therefore no opportunity to outweigh the harm that is caused by this proposal. Overall, it is considered that the cumulative impact of the various additions to this simple single story building will lead to a significant change to the character and appearance of this unit that in turn will have a harmful impact on the heritage assets and heritage environment of this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. I have um, public speaker, Tim and Annette Simpson, or I think it may just be Annette. If you want to unmute, there we go. Yes, hello. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, fine, yeah, carry on. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you all today. This is a revised application prepared to address the original reasons for refusal and the comments made by the Bath Preservation Trust. In summary, the improvements have been to reduce the height of the mansard roof and redesign it to ensure greater separation between Abbey Lodge and um, 30A. The dormer windows have been reduced in size and the roof material changed to slate. Solar panels have been incorporated and covered cycle parking has also been included. I'd like to draw the committee's attention to four main points, the setting of the listed buildings, the impact on the conservation area, the loss of amenity to Abbey Lodge and the environmental impact of the proposals. 30A is not listed, it's poor quality and detrimental to the listed building Abbey Lodge and Oxford Terrace. 
demolishing a side, ex ex side extension, which will only happen through um, this new planning application, separates 30A from Oxford Terrace and improves the setting of these listed buildings and the conservation area. It's acknowledged by the planning officer that the roof extension creates less than substantial harm and acknowledges the public benefit to the adjacent listed terrace of the demolition of this poorly executed extension. The Bath Preservation Trust also support the demolition of the side extension. The new mansard roof increases the height of the building by 1.37 metres, less than a full storey. 30A can only be seen from two public vantage points. The council's landscape team were consulted on the previous application and they had no landscape or visual objection to the proposal, stating that the mansard is unlikely to result in any significant harm to the OUV of the World Heritage Site or the character and appearance of the Bath Conservation Area. Bath Preservation Trust states that the revised reductions in roof height and width are a notable improvement to the scheme. The increased gap created from the 1886 wing means the proposal can be better read as a separate dwelling in close range views, whilst remaining suitably recessive in scale and design and without significant architectural conflict. In the officer's report, reference is made to the loss of light and outlook from Abbey Lodge. Two windows referred to serve a non-habitable storeroom and as such would not require any amenity assessments in terms of daylight sunlight in accordance with the BRE guidance. The outlook from the windows is the blank side wall of number 32, so there'll be no impact on the outlook or the sense of enclosure from this room. The proposal seek to minimise the home's impact on the environment by introducing the use of solar panels which when combined with a storage battery, new double glazed windows and improvements to the fabric of the building will minimise the energy requirement of the dwelling and its carbon emissions. Two covered cycle spaces have also been included. So in summary, the dwelling is currently derelict and uninhabitable due to years of neglect. Renovating this existing property brings back a much needed two bedroom dwelling with a significant garden in a central location in Bath. The design of the proposals represent a considered approach that will enhance the appearance of this small dwelling. The slated mansard roof reflects historic roof forms in this area and provides a public benefit by improving the setting of the listed buildings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Annette. Um, we move on to questions, uh, no other speakers, we move on to questions for the officer and I have Councillor Jackson. Now, I wondered if um, we could have a little bit more about the parking well, yeah, the parking situation where I have to confess I'm a little bit confused about who parks where and whether with this um, new construction it will meet the parking standard for residential areas of Bath or is it considered a sustainable location? I'm, I'm afraid that's question number one. And question number two, I wondered if we could have a bit of guidance on how much weight we should put to the fact that this proposal will definitely improve what is currently there, but is it at too great a cost in terms of its impact on the wider neighbourhood? Um, on highways, I will probably um, ask Darren to um, intervene, but um, just to um, explain that the currently the um, Abbey Lodge benefits from using the courtyard immediately in front of the west elevation of 30A for its parking area. Um, my understanding is that 30A's parking uh, rights were to have permit parking on Lincoln Hill itself. Um, and obviously, once the, the garage was converted, they had to resort to that. They wouldn't be able to use the garage itself for uh, parking for 30A. Um, but when, when, that, when the garage was converted, we don't know. So it, it was, I think, some time um, ago that uh, the garage was converted. So the, that unit had not been using the site unless it was just using part of Abbey Lodge's garden in a sort of, you know, friendly sort of arrangement. Um, so the, the current scheme provides 
uh, cycle storage. So it will provide cycling um, parking, if you like. And it is also within a sustainable part of the city. So it is within walking distance of the town of the city centre and um, particularly the station and the bus station. So those, those things are uh, in its favour. Um, but perhaps if I just pass over to Mr Cox, um, he can explain a bit more about highways. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Caroline. Just to add to, to what Caroline has said, um, at, the, at the moment, the, um, the dwelling exists within parking zone um, three. I've checked with colleagues in, in parking services and they have um, confirmed that as long as the, um, the entry of the existing dwelling in the local land property gazetteer doesn't change and the works are simply an extension to the existing building, then the dwelling um, retains all current entitlements to, to parking permits, um, allowing future occupiers to, to um, apply for permits, which permits them to park on street within parking zone three. Um, as, as Carolina said, the revised um, plans that we have received now include two secure covered cycle stands. And we do, as um, highway development control officers, consider that the, the site is sustainable, just a, a short walk from the, the railway station, the, the bus and coach station, and also the facilities that are provided by um, the, the town centre, which is uh, is just a short walk away, albeit it's, um, it's, it's, it's sort of downhill and then uphill coming back. So um, we, are, we are satisfied that um, uh, there are no parking issues associated with this, uh, this application. You. Thank you okay? very much. That, that clarifies something I wanted to know about parking permits. Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Craig. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Jackson has asked um, the best part of what I wanted to understand, which is about the parking. Um, but just because my first question was going to be, was is this an extension or is it a dwelling in its own right, uh, which has been answered. It's an extension. It's not a dwelling in its own right, because if it were a new dwelling, then uh, it couldn't have a residence permit, if I've understood things correctly. But what, what control is there for this not to become a separate dwelling? I mean, what does separate dwelling mean? Can, can um, the property be rented out to somebody completely different and separate, for instance, from the residence of the um, main building? Um, how does any of that get controlled? Um, sorry, my understanding of this um, proposal is that it will, it, it's always been a separate entity. It's never been part of Abbey Lodge. That's the first point. It's always been a separate dwelling and it will continue to be a separate dwelling. It's just that happens that the owner is the same owner as Abbey Lodge. Okay, right. So, so the the each of the properties has a right and will continue to have a right to residence parking. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor McPhee. Um, my question uh, to you was that it seemed to me, from looking at the view. Uh, uh, which is almost the only way that we would get to see the building, is that it appeared to improve the vision because it was obscuring the uh, lean-to, which was rather dominant. Would you agree with that? That's just a matter of uh, opinion, I suppose. The bottom line is, um, I can't remember from... Um, my distant uh, memory of that particular building on the site, the lean-to, is that it um, may well have just been picking up sunlight on, the, on that particular day. Because um, I, 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 from memory, think it's got quite a, a normal sort of natural uh, roof covering on it, probably a, a slate roof covering. So it wouldn't normally have been quite so shiny um, I'm not quite sure why those photographs do depict it in that way. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't ask um, the applicants that question, but um, it, it is um, a building that is usually um, 
within it's within the grounds it's an ancillary building and it doesn't really um have a huge um contribution towards the overall um assessment of of this particular scheme it just happened to show up quite well in those photos okay uh then uh, councillor hodge yeah sorry just going back to parking again um or two questions um so I only read the original, um, in your original report, the comments from the neighbour of number 32, which is listed as an objection. I, so I haven't read the update one. I just want to be clear, that space to the left-hand side, um, if the cycle um, storage wasn't eventually constructed and the railings didn't go up, would um, any occupier of, of that, of the new building, be allowed to park in the space in between? Would, would that be permissible? Is there anything to stop that happening? Um, we may be able to put, um, if, if you were minded to approve this scheme, we may be able to put some sort of condition on the application to prevent that happening uh, or to ensure that the, um, the full application is implemented, if you like. Um, I, I'm sure we could uh, ensure that the bike and refuse um, stores are are actually you know completed and constructed to um, protect the end of number 32 I mean that was the whole point of allowing the demolition of that structure in the first place and my second query is about the roofing material so it's good that it's changed from zinc to slate and again could we put a condition as the type of slate is quite important to the visual appearance of the mansard could could we have a condition on, on that slate material? Yes, of course, if, if you're minded to approve it, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Hugh. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Jackson has another thought. Yes, sorry, this is really a bit different. I, I have a problem. When you stand on Lincoln, is it Lincoln Road or Lincoln Hill, and look up the hillside, You've not only got this distraction of the outbuilding that's shining, and that would suggest to me that the polyvoltic panels should actually go on that outbuilding at the back, as it's also in the ownership of Abbey Lodge. But what you are reading is a building alongside Abbey Lodge with a mansard roof, but Abbey Lodge itself has got that rather interesting flat roof with crenellations and the windows with what I would call perpendicular style on a church building. Um, whereas the mansard roof buildings are down in Oxford Terrace and around, um, that's my first problem. And my second problem is that the windows in the dormer structure in the roof are neither one thing nor the other. They're neither as big as some of the ones in the neighborhood nor as small as others. <coughs> So it's a bit of a hybrid. And I, I mean, would it not have been a good idea to have the same sort of square roof as Abbey Lodge rather than this mansard, which um, reads rather strangely, I think, if it's meant to be subservient to Abbey Lodge? Is that a question for Caroline? <laughs> Um, um, it's a, a little bit uh, difficult to to discuss that uh, in the sense that um, clearly the only way the applicants, as far as I can see, can get the amount of accommodation that they want in this unit um, is to put a mansard roof on it. Um, I did discuss with them the the um, alternative might be to to retain. Um, a rebuilt form of the garage structure to accommodate another, you know, room in, in, in the sort of ground floor area rather than to build up. Um, but for all sorts of reasons, it was it was considered to be acceptable. I think it would be very difficult for them to provide the, the level of accommodation they want to without building a mansard. I don't know whether that answers your question. If you take the ridge of the mansard and square it off and drop down to the existing walls, would that not be except? The only problem with that one, of course, is you perhaps further obscure the windows on the side of Abbey Lodge. I know we're not supposed to redesign applications, but I am <laughs> asking the question, 
is a mansard really the only solution here? I'm sure that there are alternative ways of doing it, but um, it is the only one that's been put before us yeah. to consider. This is the application before us. <laughs> um, Councillor Hughes, you say your question's been answered. Councillor Hodges, another question or are we- ready Yes, to another no, question? sorry, another question. It's, I'm sorry about this. It's about the detailing of the dormer windows um, in the mansard. So the two dormers, um, I see that, um, Bath Preservation Trust are uh, uh, pleased that they're slightly more grounded, they're, they're, they're positioned behind the parapet and lower down in the mansard. Are they, um, are they, I can't remember the picture, are they sashes and will they be of, um, you know, conventional, they're different, obviously a different style from the main building, but will they be conventional wooden sashes with a, again, in that some way heritage type sashes? Um, I think it's unlikely. If you look at the fenestration on, on the main body of the building, that is proposed to be, um, from memory, again, I need to um, see if I can go back and check while we're talking, but I think it's they're just um, aluminium framed windows. Um, so they're quite contemporary uh, looking. I'm not sure that there's going to be any traditional looking windows or fenestration intended in this building. Uh, it's It's, it is not even is, in the mansard because that's even quite in the visible. mansard i believe yeah. they're going to be casements um i i haven't that sort of mm -hmm. level of detail hasn't quite frankly been discussed um uh because of the, the the way we've obviously um considered this application in in the round and more generally we've considered it's unacceptable in its general sense okay so, is there any comparison to be made with the other because there's lots of other Dormer sort of window. window yeah. Dormer windows knocking about in, in the in the wide shot. There doesn't seem to be any kind of continuity. So it's almost impossible to make that comparison with. Yeah, I mean Oxford Terrace has got a huge array of different dorm dormers throughout its whole terrace. And unfortunately, quite a lot of those are, are quite different in character to what we would might expect in a traditional listed building. So um there there are quite a number to um it would be difficult to to actually have those replicated in this one and i, I have to say the dormers in the, the proposed scheme are probably quite a lot better than what we have in oxford terrace but do you think they're hardwood casement that's in the picture i'm sure we could con consider conditioning those if if you wanted to improve weren't. the scheme so we can condition that to ensure whatever or whatever detail you think is appropriate, perhaps not aluminium in the, in the roof. So if it, yeah, so if we could yeah consider conditioning to wood, a wooden window in the roof. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, if uh, just as we move into the debate, if anyone's proposing uh, to overturn the officer's decision, can I suggest we delegate to permit so that we can make sure we covered all these off. Uh, but we go into the debate now. If there's no for, for, oh no, uh, Councillor Rigby has a question. Sorry, Chair, it was my fault. I put it up late, um, but I have got a question, and I think I know the answer is going to be no. But it's following on to the point that you just made. Um, the uh, there seems to be quite a lot of detail that that we're either um, and for very good reason we've not got in front of us. Um, rather than us spending a lot of time trying to condition stuff. Could we actually say, were we to be minded to overturn the officer's recommendation that, in fact, what we were giving was outline planning, um, but we actually wanted to see the detail come back? Because if we don't, I suspect we're going to spend a lot of time today, if we are minded to approve it, trying to do a lot of the conditioning work um, that, that we would want to see the officer, uh, we would probably want to see come back, frankly, because I think the detail in this is the stuff that's going to make the difference to whether or not we want to, or for me, will make the difference to whether or not we can approve it. So could we change it to an outline planning with detail to come back rather than a planning? Yeah, everyone's shaking their head. I thought it was worth a try um, because I don't particularly want to spend a lot of time working out conditions and then delegating. But Rich, do you want to comment? Rich, yeah, I was just going to clarify on that. The, the type of application is determined by what they've applied for. So they've applied for a full planning permission and it has to be considered as such. Now, it's within the gift of the, the committee uh, to go against the officer recommendation if 
they felt persuaded to do so. Um, and there would be, from the debate, it's, it's clear that there are conditions that would be necessary to make it acceptable. But we couldn't change the terms of the application from a full as it is to effectively an outline in the, the conventional planning sense. So, yeah. Okay, so, uh, I've, uh, um, sorry, Councillor Jackson, do you wanted a question on that? Well, no, I just wanted to make a suggestion because I'm very much with what uh, Councillor Rigby is saying. Um, obviously, we are supposed to make a decision on what is on the table in front of us. And I don't know if we're uncomfortable about the details as I am. Should we then vote against? Should we then vote with the officer? Or is it possible to defer a decision to next month's meeting and and hope to see it come back with all these conditions that I think uh, both Councillor Hodge and Councillor Rigby have rightly drawn our attention to. Uh, I'm wondering whether we could um, ask for further information and detail yeah. from yeah. the applicants on materials and that sort of level of detail and then um, I'm not sure it would change the fundamental issues that we've got with the scheme, but at least we can then um, helpfully advise you what those materials are, etc. Is that something that would be helpful? Definitely. Um, can I just take some more comments before we come to that? Uh, which, Hal McPhee, Councillor McPhee, wanted to speak. Well, that was the debate. Is, we, we are, are we, we are. moving to the debate now? We, I think we are in the debate and, and we're debating how we take this forwards. Yeah. Well, from my perspective, I mean, the property, the current property is poor. I'm very happy to see that go. And it's been it's been allowed to get rid of. The only issue that seems to me that stops me from from it is is that the windows are still looking over the roof, There's, that roof is still going to be um, uh, uh, very visible, but it, apparently these are non-habitable storerooms or something, but I mean, that it could change, I suppose. But from my perspective, I would be quite happy to overturn the, the uh, officer's decision with the conditions that have already been spoken to or with uh, seeking further information. Um, and certainly the view uh, is improved, it seems to me, with the mansard roof there. So th that's where I stand. Okay, Councillor Davis. I was only going to suggest maybe um, a site visit with a bit of difference in the sense that if we, we often have site visits when we want to find out something more about a property, Maybe this one, it's not actually we want to see the property so much, but ask the details. And I didn't know if that was a way forward to answer the queries that were being raised earlier. It's just a thought. I don't know. OK, uh, Councillor Clark, were you looking to back that notion up? Yeah, I, actually, I was going to suggest it. And so therefore, yes, I do back it. Uh, Councillor Rigby, you wanted to propose something. As well. That was exactly what I was going to propose, that we have a site visit, but also use that time to um, firm up a lot of the details that we've been asking the questions about, so it returns next month. I'll second that. Uh, okay, uh, Cans uh, Caroline, did you want to add? Sorry, I, I, um, Chair, I've just been checking the original application while you've been talking, and I confirm the windows proposed were all going to be metal aluminium. Right. I would um, like to make my proposal. I think, I think actually, I don't want to take uh, Councillor Davis's um, thunder. I think she was kind of proposing that as well. Um, so, you know, no ego about who proposes it, but I think that's something that perhaps we should maybe vote on, Chair, as, as a way forward for today. OK, so, so I mean, we're looking for a site visit where we ask for further information on the details, but we've just had uh, the notif notification on some of those details that it, you know the windows are not hardwood they're aluminium um so but uh, if, uh, let, let's uh oh councillor hughes you want, let's have a comment from let's have a comment from you and then i'll go to a vote on a site visit so i'm just trying to understand so if we decide to, to vote for a, a site visit between now and the site visit does the applicant have an opportunity to change some of these details 
or are we, are we still stuck with the original submission? We 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 have the original submission. Is, is would be my understanding. <laughs> Rich, do you want to? Yeah, so we can, I think as Caroline outlined, we can, uh, and the applicant may take the opportunity between, if it is deferred for a site visit between now and the next committee, uh, to submit additional details to clarify the points that have, have come through the debate here. Uh, but I think as Caroline said before, the, the those changes to detail wouldn't address the fundamental concern in conservation and, and design and, and impact on the setting of adjacent list, listed buildings um, because that those concerns stem from the the overall bulk scale mass design of the the proposed roof um, so we'd still be considered or it's likely that whilst we may have addressed the concerns that have come through and the suggested conditions that have come through uh, a site visit and design uh, refinements between now and the next committee probably wouldn't address the fundamental a recommendation for refusal so it's the, you'd be considering an application with the benefit of potentially additional information and the benefit of having been on site but likely to still be the same recommendation as, as is before you today uh, i hope that clarifies thank you lucy did you want to add something on that yeah so i was, I was wondering that the, the benefits of an extra zoom site visit I, I in some ways i can't see them in relation to the three points we've made about conditioning slates, um, conditioning the retention of the bicycle space and, and the detailing of the windows, which we know is aluminium, we, we will still know it's aluminium after the site visit. Um, you know, I can, there's possibly, gen, you know, possibly benefits in a site visit and getting more than the photos, but Caroline showed a lot of photos and we're, we're not looking for that. We're looking for the, the resolution of these three conditions. So that's that's what I possibly have a problem with. I don't know whether if we, in debate, we all feel we feel the same way about the, the conditions that you could, you know, you, we could then come to a conclusion yeah. now. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in agreement with you. If, if if we're going to overturn the officer's recommendation and delegate to permit, then I and we, we need to think about the things we've asked for today, which is, is conditioning on the on the that parking area to ensure that the application as set out is delivered with those bicycle storage areas, so you can't get a car in. Uh, and I think the the idea has been expressed that we want to, we'd want to see hardwood uh, uh, window frames for the for the for the building and not aluminium um, and I, I'm not sure that there are any other obstacles in the way of a delegate to permit uh, other than that but Caroline can I just ask the question is there any relative value difference between aluminium frames and uh, hardwood frames is hardwood more in keeping with uh, with the area and conservation Um, yes, I mean, absolutely, Chair. If you look to either side, those those uh, listed buildings are predominantly timber framed uh, fenestration and doors. So um, we would certainly welcome the opportunity to improve the quality of the fenestration and doors into 30A. Um, because as I said, it's not just the roof, although that's our primary issue, it's also the cumulative impact of the other parts of this design. Um, if you look at the front door, for instance, it, it just looks like um, a door that we would not normally consider acceptable in this sort of situation. So um, we, we would welcome an opportunity to have another go at that sort of design level. Okay, so in that case, can I see if anyone's willing to move that we delegate to permit yeah. uh, and require officers to seek yeah. improvements to the design? Chair, um, uh, and, uh, Councillor McCabe, uh, yeah. uh, I got the impression that uh, when Councillor McPhee spoke, uh, he, he was actually proposing delegate to permit. And if that is the case, I, I will second it. Uh, Councillor McPhee, were you, <laughs> were you proposing? You're, you're not on mute, so you are now. I, 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 I was saying that uh, when it was right, I was perfectly happy to go for a uh, delegate to permit with the conditions that Councillor Hodge has listed and you've expanded on. 
Okay, uh, Marie's just popped into uh, the thing that the, we have a motion on the table for a site visit. Uh, Councillor Hughes, did you want to speak just before? Yeah, I just, I just want to, if, if we are going down that, the road of uh, delegates permit, this condition to do with the space between the two houses where the garage is, um, I'm just concerned that we, that the restriction, we're talking about just in making sure they put in the, the bike storage in there. But in future, that doesn't necessarily give um, 32 Oxford Terrace the reassurance they may want that in the future that may disappear and a car park might appear there. So can that be a restriction on, on vehicle? Can that condition happen or? Uh, well, uh, yeah, at the, at the moment, it part of the, the proposal in front of us has the bike storage and the bin storage and the main entrance to the building. Um, so, uh, but if, if that were to if that were to disappear in a year's time and a vehicle were to appear in that gap, what would well, be the restriction? That, that, that would be uh, a, a breach of what we've given permission for, and the owner is is the applicant, uh, and so they would be required to adhere to the planning permission they submitted. Richard, do you want to comment? Sorry, Matt. Um, I think there's, uh, it's it's in the comments. Uh, there is the motion on the table uh, to defer for a site visit at the moment, and I think the debate is now starting to swing towards whether we're going with or overturning officer recommendation. So I think we either need to move to a vote on the motion that's on the table or withdraw that motion before we proceed sort of further down the line with, with other discussion. Okay. Uh, Councillor Jackson. As well, Chair. Sorry. Sorry. Chair, if I could just explain why I'm seconding a site visit, if you haven't got another name attached to the proposal for a site visit. Namely, I'm very uncomfortable with the spatial relations of this house, which I can't... I, I'm thinking about what would we do if this was a normal meeting and an action you know we could actually look at things better and I would be strongly arguing for a site visit because there are some angles which I can list to the officer which I would want to look at from the front garden of uh, Abbey Lodge and also from the back by that where that extension is because I can't and we've been talking a lot about this possible parking space at the side of the house I can't quite get it in my mind how things relate to each other and therefore what the impact of this mansard roof is going to be. So that's why I am backing the idea of a site visit so I can okay. get spatially connected. But of course it will have the collateral benefit that we can get all these conditions sorted out. Uh, uh, just remind me who, who moved the motion for the site visit? Well, I thought it was Manda. It was Manda. Okay. Uh, Simon Barnes. Yeah. Simon Barnes, you wanted to comment. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, if I, if I it might help um, if I just sort of clarified where I, I think we've got to. So I think um, Councillor McPhee, um, according to my notes, had moved um, to overturn, but then I don't think that was seconded. And then we had the motion from Councillor Rigby for a site visit, which was seconded by Councillor Jackson. So by my notes that's the motion that's currently on the table if you want to um to vote on a motion to overturn and delegate to permit then i think the site visit motion would need to be withdrawn um and then the councillor mcphee's motion would then need to be seconded okay uh, and then presumably uh, that would be delegate to permit with conditions and obviously you might want to clarify what types of conditions you would be looking for and obviously we would need to be clear about the reasons for overturning the officer recommendation. Okay so let's, uh, Councillor Ruby, are you still happy we move to a vote on your motion? Are you not going to withdraw it? I'm certainly not going to withdraw it, I'd quite, right. like, to, I'd quite like to speak to it though. Uh, well uh, we've got the motion, we've got the second deck, can we, can we, you want to speak before we move to the vote? Yes please. Go on then. Um, so, uh, and, and, and I don't want to disagree entirely with the legal officer, but I actually think it was the other way around. I think Sally and uh, Vic moved, sort of moved the motion, then I moved the motion and then Eleanor did. So I think we had the site visit motion on first, but we'll be able to look at the video afterwards and just check. Um, but given the fact we do it, this is what we're doing. So I half agree with my seconder and I half disagree, to be honest. Me, the prime, there, is a, there is a thing about getting the spatial views sorted. But for, for me, the thing that provoked me to say this more than anything was Councillor Davis's comment about perhaps just deferring it 
to the next um, committee meeting. So in my head, I was thinking if we defer it to the next committee meeting to get some of these conditions properly worded, so we're not trying to do them on the hoof now, we're not trying to work out what we think is acceptable, what we think isn't acceptable. And if we're doing that, it would seem churlish not to use that time to also have a site visit so that we can look at all the spatial things that have come up. Because my fear is that if we do move to overturn the officer's recommendation and start trying to chuck in a whole heap of conditions now and try and do a delegate to permit, something that we think is important will get missed. I'm firmly of a belief that we should have this in front of us and debate it properly rather than try and, um, um, and make up our conditions on the hoof as we are now. Okay, so the motion before us is to have a site visit. Uh, I will go through al alphabetic in alphabetical order. Uh, uh, counts. Uh, well, it's a motion to for a site visit and to give officers the time to to sort out some of the additional detail. Yeah. Right. Uh, for, against, or abstaining, uh, Councillor Clark. Or. Councillor Craig. Or. Councillor Davis. Or. Councillor Hodge. Or. Councillor Hounsell. Abstain. Uh, Councillor Hughes. Or. Councillor Jackson. For. Councillor McPhee. Against. Uh, Councillor McCabe against. Councillor Rigby. For. Okay, so that uh, is carried. Marie, the numbers? Yeah, that's seven in favour, two against and one abstention, Chair. Okay, so that we, we will have a site visit and the request to the officer is to actually if, if the expectation is that we might uh, turn around and delegate to permit uh, is to actually, for the officer to uh, uh, look at some of the other detail around design and get further information um, uh, from the applicant. Everyone nodding, there's some nods there, good, right. Uh, so that's the decision. Um, can we have a comfort break now for five minutes? Please, See, so, that uh, needs food. <laughs> Just about half past then, just before half past. And uh, is Rich still there? No. I'm still here, Matt. Oh, oh you are. Um, I was so just is, about that, to. is that okay then? Uh, and I, I just had a question does that mean that the officer is able to negotiate some of those, some of that information on the detail? Or is we can finding... clarify some of the yeah. So the, the issue around the the windows or the, the windows and the doors. Windows. Yeah, can I just you're still live, chair? Right, you're yeah, oh. still live. So I was just uh, I was just asking for. I don't want to open up the debate again, but yeah, yeah. It's it's the uh, it's it's the it's the detail that the officer suggested that they you hadn't considered some of that detail because the objection was on was on other things. So yeah. it's, it's, it's time we, to we can it. clarify some elements of the detail. Great stuff. Fine. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks.
right here. Um, it, it hasn't happened yet that uh, we, uh, we run past one o'clock, but the understanding is that the morning uh, meetings, uh, the, the meeting beginning in the morning at 11 o'clock is, is that we will get 40 minutes for lunch. Uh, and if the item runs beyond what would be, I think, 1.20, then the two o'clock start will be delayed. OK, so, so, so the idea is we get 40 minutes for lunch. Right, so just waiting for the last few people to come back. Caroline, you're still here, that's good news. <laughs> Councillor McPhee, are you there? Oh, yeah, totally good. So I think that's everybody back. Uh, the next item is uh, the Friends Meeting House, York Street, Bath. It's items four and five because there's the planning application and the listed building application. And uh, we still have Caroline Waldron with us. Caroline, would you like to present your report, please? Okay, Chair, can everyone see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so uh, as you've just explained, I'm actually um, standing in for Caroline Wardron on this one. So I'm going to be having to read quite a lot of notes because I don't know this um, site or this application particularly well, I'm afraid. Um, so it relates to Friends Meeting House in York Street, Bath, and it's for, uh, the installation of external um, signs for um, a new um, bookshop that's going to be taking over the premises. Um, but you all know the bookshop because it's Toppings, so it's quite a famous um, bookshop in Bath already. Uh, they're just relocating. Uh, and it's for four hand painted, four hand painted timber signs fixed onto the side and front elevations of the uh, meeting house and one hand painted sign applied to um, the portico. Um, you should probably, we'll all probably know where it is. Um, it's um, a grade two listed building. It's in the heart of the conservation area and, and world heritage site, very close proximity to um, the Roman baths and the abbey. Uh, it was built in around 1817 to 1819 in a Greek revival style, originally as a Freemasons hall. And it was designed by William Wilkins and has a strong architectural presence in the street scene. The portico itself contains symb symbolically um, blind doorway with functional flanking entrances. Uh, so the building has been used as an assembly room and non-conformist chapel uh, and more recently the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers, has owned the building, sorry, since uh, 1866, so that's not more re recently, but since 1880s, 1866 it's been um, in the Quaker U ownership. This is the proposed scheme. Um, as you can see, it's predominantly for boards. Um, so this is the only plan we have for the scheme. Um, and it shows uh, what one of the boards is like. Um, just bear me, with me a minute while I get the details. Um, so each board is approximately two meters by one meter. So two meters tall uh, and one, one meter 20 wide. Um, and they're going to be in this uh, blue color with yellow writing. They're all timber, but they are actually going to be uh, fixed 
to the masonry by countersinking the fixings into the masonry. So that's four signs doing with uh, four holes, I should imagine, or maybe more fixings for each sign into the masonry. Um, so two boards will be positioned either side of the new central entrance doors within the portico itself facing the, the street on the north elevation and then two further boards on the uh, return walls of the portico facing east and west along the street. The other um, part of this scheme is to the um, pediment at the top of the building where there's ex an existing sign um, painted on saying friends meeting house and that will be painted over with the new signage. And this is a, an artistic um, representation of what those signs will look like in the street. Um, members should also be aware that planning permission and list of building consent for the change of use to retail has already been granted. Um, and part of that scheme was to uh, provide a new door, set of doors within the central uh, uh, portico of the building, um, replacing the symbol, symbolic blind central opening that's all, be, always been part of the original building with functioning doors approached by new generously proportioned steps. During opening hours, the doors will be left open and the interior protected by sliding glass doors, which will itself signal a change of use at, of the building and welcome people in. There is no objection to the principle of introducing new signage to the exterior of the building along with an element of colour. However, the high quality design and execution of the meeting house and the monumental nature of the architecture forms a landmark building in the historic street scene, which demands, in our opinion, exemplary and bespoke approach to, this, to the design and positioning of the signage. Um, so, now we're just going to see some series of photos of the existing building in the street. Um, forgive us for the, the road um, traffic uh, measures that have been uh, <laughs> taking place when these photographs were being uh, taken. So um, the officer involved in this scheme has uh, says in her um, write up that um, she, she believes that the submitted proposals for a standard and intensive package of commercial signage is unfortunate. Although the materials proposed are painted timber, four signboards, each measuring 2.1 meters tall and 1.2 meters wide, would be very large and visually intrusive dominating and detracting from the design and architectural presence of the meeting house and impinging de detrimentally into the wider street scene. The overall result would harm the significance of the listed building and the wider character of the conservation area. Painting the bookshop name across the portico, and I think we've got a picture here, shows the portico with the painted Friends Meeting House you can just make out there. It's in um, relatively poor condition, um, obviously hasn't been repainted for a while. And there's clear evidence that the, build, that the building has had um, signage painted up there in the past. However, this is what we would call ghost signage and is quite an important characteristic of Bath city centre. Um, and what uh, Caroline says is that painting the bookshop name across the portico frieze would cause harm to the heritage asset in two ways. Firstly, the existing name Friends Meeting House is intrinsic to the building's historic narrative 
and its loss would diminish the historic and evidential value of the listed building. Secondly, the use of the blue and yellow colour scheme at high level would disrupt the integrity and harmony of the building design, causing an unacceptable and unnecessary level of harm to the significance of this listed building. Retention re and repair is always the appropriate heritage-led led approach. Just going on for another view of the building here. And then again, a more close-up picture. We also say more general concerns have been raised about the blue and yellow colour scheme for the portico boards. The agent has confirmed that the intention is to colour match the existing shop front where these colours were used in shades that are not overly strident. There is in this case no sound heritage reason for the applicant not to use the shop's established colour scheme. The suitability of the colour combination could, if the scheme were otherwise acceptable, be confirmed by requesting samples. The existing shop, book, sorry, the existing bookshop, as everyone will know, um, at the top or the bottom of uh, Lansdowne, is frequently um, uh, advertises temporary events such as book signing. The, the current proposals make no provision for, th for this um, and we believe would lead to an additional need for signage being added in a piecemeal fashion on and around the meeting house, which would be further de detriment to both the listed building and the wider area. Council officers have engaged proactively with the scheme's architect to put forward a number of alternative solutions for discussion to achieve a more sensitive and creative signage solution, which apparently are described in the report. However, the applicant has declined the applications, has declined to negotiate and the applications must therefore be determined on the basis of the submitted proposals. And I think there's one last um, photograph just showing the portico in more detail and clearly that very strong blind opening in the centre of the portico there, which will, um, uh, as you're aware, become double doors in the new uh, retail unit. So um, that's the scheme um, as proposed um, for refusal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um got uh, public speakers. We've got Hugh and Cornelia Topping, who are the applicants. I can see you and hopefully you'll be unmuted. There we go. Uh, and uh, off you go. Hello. Um, thank you for, for taking the time uh, to consider this today. Uh, I'm Hugh Topping. This is my sister, Cornelia Topping. Uh, Topping and Company Booksellers is a family-run, independent business. Uh, we've been going for 20 years and we're the uh, second generation we opened in Bath 14 years ago, and uh, we are well established in the city, but it's fair to say that our existing bookshop on the Paragon is quite far removed from the buzz of the city centre, and at uh, points this has made trading quite challenging. Moving to York Street means that we can offer an even wider range of books in the larger space, and the location affords us the opportunity to attract passing trade from visitors in a way that's just not possible uh, in our current location. The Friends Meeting House is such an exciting prospect for us um, and we've completely fallen in love with the building. When we very first looked around the building, we knew that its, it's quiet grandeur and uh, interesting history would make for a wonderful bookshop for the city. However, I think it's important to note that the Friends Meeting House is very far removed from a traditional shop front and is therefore essential that the building's signage can prominently and accurately reflect both its use and the fact that it is open to the public for browsing. Moving on to the current state of the building, um, a large part of this project is the restoration and rejuvenation of the building. One particularly relevant area is the exterior paintwork. Analysis commissioned by the Friends in 2016 shows that the Frieze has had at least nine paint schemes in different styles since the building was constructed. 
It is now in really poor condition. And as you can see, the various layers are now blistering and peeling away. The current paintwork was applied in the 80s and the report makes clear that its condition is very unsatisfactory and is in fact, unfortunately, encouraging decay of the underlying stonework. Another area which has exemplified to us the need for long-term guardians of this building is the case of the, of the distinctive lanterns on the roof of the building. Following an inspection last week, we found that they are rotting away and require emergency remedial action. We're aiming to continue bookselling for many generations to come, and we are deeply conscious of our role in looking after the buildings we occupy for the long term. Aesthetically, we take a very traditional approach, and this is reflected in our restrained and elegant hand-painted signage. Can I, can I just stop you there for a moment? Uh, you're not allowed to submit further evidence, uh, so please don't keep pop popping these extra images in. Uh, you, you may have done very well sorting out a presentation, <laughs> but uh, it's not allowed, I'm afraid, because it's offering, oh, apologies, even if you think it, it's um, maybe illustrating what you're saying, but I'm afraid you're not allowed to do it. But if you want to go back just a few a few sentences and, and repeat, and I won't, won't take any time off you, sorry. Okay. Um, so aesthetically, we take a very traditional approach, and this is reflected in our restrained and elegant hand-painted signage. We've engaged a traditional master sign writer with whom we have worked previously for our existing bookshop in Bath and also our newest bookshop in a grade A or category one equivalent Georgian building in Edinburgh. Our new Bath bookshop will be the largest independent bookshop to open in England in living memory. Um, it's a major project and investment for us and for Bath after a particularly challenging year. In order to be able to protect the building for the long term, it must, of course, be a commercially viable endeavour. We believe strongly that the Friends Meeting House merits a bespoke approach rather than applying policies that were originally drawn up with completely different buildings in mind. It is a large building and the signage, therefore, has to be proportionate to its scale. The success of this project will be dependent on attracting browsers from all of the different angles from which the building is visible. Um, and so I hope we have demonstrated the direct relationship between having elegant, traditional, um, proportionate signage in tasteful fire and ball colours, um, indicating that the space is a bookshop uh, and it is encouraging people to come in and browse. And this in turn means that it will be a commercially successful project and that ensures that we will be able to be there for a long time. Um, and so by acknowledging the commercial realities, we will be able to invest in the rejuvenation and care of this magnificent building in the long term. Uh, and so I hope that you will support us and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I had to interrupt your flow. Uh, Councillor Craig is speaking as the ward councillor. And then I think Councillor Craig, you're removing yourself from the debate and the vote. There, off you go. Thank you, Chair. Um, when considering planning applications for listed buildings in the City of Bath, our job as members of the planning committee is to assess any potential harm that might be caused to the outstanding universal value of a World Heritage Site and its assets, and to weigh that against the public benefit to be gained by granting permission. The Friends Meeting House is a unique building set in the Abbey Quarter of Bath City Centre. Bath Quakers owned the Friends Meeting House from 1866, but due to declining numbers, no longer needed such a large building and put it up for sale first in 1975, then 2008, and most recently at the start of last year. Several possible uses were considered in 1978, including art gallery or heritage centre, but no viable buyer came forward, so the property was removed from the market. In 2008, Despite consent having been granted to change use from meeting house to a restaurant, the one pot potential sale that came forward fell through due to a lack of confidence after the financial crash. Since then, it has been used for occasional events, but for the most part has sadly, for such a magnificent building, presented a blank space in York Street. Although the area surrounding the Abbey and Roman Baths is busy and attracts a lot of tourists, the peripheral areas of the Abbey Quarter have increasingly suffered and round the corner along Orange Grove has also struggled to survive. 
This was exacerbated by the opening of the Southgate Shopping Centre in November 2009, which redirected pedestrian traffic from Bar Spa Station so that people no longer naturally walked up Pierpont Street and through York Street to Rome Bars, but were instead drawn through the new precinct, reducing footfall significantly through York Street. The necessary hoardings around the Abbey for the last few years have also acted as a deterrent to visitors wandering into York Street and Orange Grove. Before we were hit by the pandemic, the public realm team was working hard to restore footfall to the Abbey Quarter. The artisan market is a welcome addition to Abbey Green and had extended into Kingston Parade before we went into lockdown. This market, which supports independent local businesses selling crafts, food, drink, textiles and more, will be back as soon as Covid rules allow and it's hoped that it will extend further into Abbey Gate Street. The new space is developed as part of the Archway project, including the State of the Art Claw Learning Centre are due to open this year, which will also draw additional footfall into the Stall Street end of York Street. Finally, the closure of York Street to motorised traffic and the new licensing laws have allowed the many small hospitality outlets in York Street to spill out onto the road and pavement, which, when things reopen, will create a vibrant bustling cafe culture which can be glimpsed from either end of York Street and from the main Abbey entrance. As Ward Councillor, I feel genuinely excited about the prospect of Topping's moving. I feel it's the final piece of the jigsaw that will regenerate this neglected part of the city centre. Topping's is in investing a huge amount of money and more importantly care into transforming the building, not only to a place that sells books, but into a space where people can browse and can sit and enjoy literature in truly magnificent surroundings. The signage was originally part of the application now approved for the rest of the work on this building, but despite the architect who did offer up more than one different option, he and the officer were unable to reach agreement on a compromise, which is why this has now come before you as a separate application. Being able to provide visual clue, clues from either end of York Street will be vital to the success of this important venture. Although they don't strictly conform to the shopfront guidance and policies, I believe that the designs offered up are tastefully done and very much in proportion with the size and mass of the overall building. The sign above the portico is not original and has been painted over several times. Bath Quakers have requested that their, that their name is removed as they no longer wish to be associated with the building. Traditional materials have been used and the colours are also kind to the structure. This is no traditional shop front and it sits amongst what is a very eclectic mix of facades and structures in this part of the city, so there is no norm with which it needs to conform. The hard decisions have already been taken with this listed asset as consent has been granted to open out the blind door, a fundamental part of its original purpose as a Masonic hall. So I would respectfully ask the committee to consider going that extra inch and permitting this application for signage so that we can see this lovely building back in use and the Abbey Quarter once again turned into a thriving area of Bath city centre. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Craig. Uh, so, questions for the officer, uh, Councillor Jackson. Um, yes, going back. I mean, I, I I'm very uncomfortable about the proposal to paint over the Friends Meeting House, and quite frankly, the Friends have now sold it. I I don't think they have a say over it. But anyway, the point is, as I recall, because I know this building very well, immediately above that. Friends Meeting House freeze, there is a Masonic sign, is there not? And I'd like I'd be interested to know there's that sign there, I, I'm pretty sure. And I'm also sure that from recollection that over the blind door there was some further Masonic symbols. And it does I would like to know what the officer thinks about this. You know, is there an argument that if the Masonic symbols are going to be allowed to remain, which I'm asking if they are, uh, why the Friends Meeting House freeze shouldn't? That's question one. And question two, recently we considered the ghost signage, I think it's the Pig and Whistle pu um, public house, isn't it? That's, um, oh dear, it's on the corner of, I'm getting tired, which street? 
Walcott Street, basically. Um, and we uh, asked for enforcement action so that that signage there that was on the wall should be retained. How much should that be a consideration in considering whether to allow what I, I would agree with the applicants is becoming somewhat ghostly on the Friends Meeting House freeze? Oh, well, um, unfortunately, because I've just taken over the case from Caroline to um, present today, I cannot answer your questions, Councillor Jackson, on Masonic signs uh, or, or um, images that may, may or may not be on the building. Um, I don't know it well enough, I'm afraid. All I can say is that looking at the photograph um, of the front, I can see there's a, uh, a number um, above the friends meeting house sign on the on the uh, sort of pediment, if you like, uh, that looks like it's 84 or 184, which may be the the number of the street, uh, the building in the street, if you like. Um, other, otherwise, I'm afraid I don't know it well enough to answer that question about uh, about any Masonic um, signs or detailing. Um, on, I can on the just about see it if you look at your side. I think the it was that sort of protractor thing that Masons use, you know, a compass. I mean, that's what I mean. There are well, I think your eyesight's better than mine. I I I, I can't. can't right, never mind. Uh, sorry. sorry. Um, Rich, never mind. You, Rich, did you want to come in on that? I, th I think it's actually the date of building. I think it's 1843 that's oh, engraved into the building. So it, I yeah, don't so think just, it's a Masonic symbol. I don't think it's a street number. I think it's actually the date of uh, date of construction. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that, that is part of the fabric <laughs> of the building. Um, um, yeah, sorry, going back, coming back on that one. I've just looked at another photograph. I can see quite well it's the date of the building. I do apologise. Um, as I said, I, you know, I took this over on yesterday or whatever it was. So um, I'm really a little bit stuck to answer your question other than to say that generally speaking, within the city centre, we very much um, respect and hold in quite a lot of esteem any ghost signage that we consider or see um, as evidence of the past activities of uh, the sort of commercial world of the Georgian and Victorian parts of uh, Bath. And, and so this sign on, on the Friends Meeting House, um, it's, it's a little bit of a difficult one to um, advise you. My, my gut feeling when I looked at this after Caroline asked me to take it over was to say, well, why couldn't the applicants provide some sort of board mm. and put um, a signage over the top rather than painting over it, which will completely, no matter how well you can deal, deal with these, uh, these um, uh, signs, you can never guarantee that you can re recreate the old signage underneath new paint. Um, <clears throat> I know I hear them saying that there's a condition issue um, and it's clear to me that some of the um, that that painted area looks as though it's been suffering from a damp problem, but that's possibly due to damp filtering through the masonry from above rather than the paint itself uh, causing issues. Uh, although we do know that the wrong type of paint does also cause problems with masonry. So um, I, without knowing the, the scheme well enough, I couldn't comment any further on that but I, I, I am troubled by the idea of it being painted over I must admit um, and my solution would be to ask them to either leave it alone um, and look at um, just conserving that area and repairing it so that we have the history of the building still there as Councillor Jackson implied or to cover it over with a board and put their new name over the top. Is that okay? And Councilor the other Jackson? question is okay. not really that relevant. Well, it is quite relevant. Um, you've explained about the blind doors being opened up and that frontage should work very well, I think. There used to be a disabled chairlift on the left-hand side by where the notice is going to be. 
And I was just wondering if you knew whether that was remaining or not. But as I said, it's not really relevant, except it would come up, I think, directly in front of one of these boards that we're considering. Um, Chair, I believe uh, yesterday um, Caroline Waldron did say that that was going to be retained because um, obviously there's a, a need to allow disabled or um, not so well um, able people to get into the building. Um, and so I understand that's being retained as part of the scheme. And the other entrance is going to be acting as a fire exit, um, which is a requirement for building regs purposes. Um, so, so we did discuss the possibility that um, both those platform areas could potentially have alternative signs uh, in those locations, if you like, rather than putting them onto the, the masonry itself, which we believe is quite damaging. Uh, okay, questions? I've got Councillor Hodge. Caroline, sorry, I, I know you'll be doing your best with this, and I think it is quite a shame we haven't got you know, Karen Waldron to kind of give these, so these details are so important, this background, and um, I realise you're doing your best in the situation. I just wanted to know whether the applicants, I mean, I, I'm concerned about the portico freeze and the, the loss of a narrative, the narrative from that. Were the applicants asked, was the uh, board across the whole freeze explored? I, I, I don't suppose you can answer that question, but I think it's important to know why, whether that was explored as an option and why it wasn't taken forward. Um, that's my first um, question. I can I, go. I, should I, I do all of them all at once? Uh, should I go? And then I've got a second one about colour. Okay, but the colour detail is the, the, the officer's report is much, talking a lot about blue and yellow and whether we should whether the, uh, they should be conditioned to the the palette, the green palette for historic buildings. I mean, the, the toppings is their palette obviously looks more like a. a a, a more subdued blue and a cream, in fact. But should if we gave permission at this stage, we we don't really have. It's just called blue and yellow. This permission, we I think we need to in some ways condition what we are getting with with the colours. Um, and the third point I had is I just wanted some clarity about the um, the um, position of the are the the the, the sorry, the signs on the portico, the sticking out bit of the portico, are they screwed hard against, are they flat against the masonry? So we've got hanging ones in, inside the portico and, and fixed ones to the masonry on the side, external sides of the portico, or are they hanging? Um, um, but the, yeah, so three questions really, the freeze, the colors. I, I, th I think, yeah. um, sorry, uh, if I do them in reverse order, for <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, which isn't very logical, but um, I, as far as I understand it, all four signs will be screwed or otherwise fixed, count, counter, um, what do we call it, count, countersunk into the masonry. So none of them will be hanging. They will all okay. be actually physically attached yeah. okay. to the walls with um, whatever fixing is uh, d decided to be you know, used, which could then entail putting holes into the masonry itself, which is something we are concerned about. Um, your point about the color scheme, we do um, often control colors through condition. Um, and that's something we would ask for samples of. Um, I know um, I looked at my Farrow and Ball um, colour chart and I couldn't actually find the colours. I think they're probably more recent than my colour chart, which is ancient. So um, uh, we would obviously strive to ensure that the colours are, um, you know, subtle colours. Um, and I'm sure um, that the applicants are intending to do that anyway from what they've said. So I'm, I'm not sure that that would be a particular issue if you chose to approve this scheme. Your first point about um, uh what was it about <laughs> it's whether the applicants got sorry uh, ex whether you explored with the applicants putting a board over the portico freeze um well this is something i i i'm having difficulty in answering in in a way that would be accurate because um i i do recall caroline saying that they did invest or she did try to investigate alternative signage through the agent with the applicants um and 
but she said that the applicants were very much in favour of the scheme that's before you. So I can't honestly answer that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Uh, okay, so if we move on to the debate, then I've got uh, Councillor Hounsell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was very impressed by Councillor Craig's um, uh, commentary to um, uh, when she addressed uh, the, the committee. I, I, I thought she expressed the uh, uh, the uh, issues uh, uh, very clearly, very eloquently. Um, York Street is a, a narrow street, uh, often gloomy, and um, often it's just a, a in the past, it's been a passageway through to uh, to, to other other streets. Um, I welcome Topping's uh, moving to this building. Uh, the best way of preserving a building is that it's it's used, uh, and uh, this is a, a, a really interesting um, uh, use of the building. Um, I'm a great supporter of uh, small and medium-sized businesses. That this particular planning application really highlights the tension that there is always in Bath between heritage and Bath being a, a, a live, um, forward-looking city. Um, what strikes me is that the um, the uh, no the the, the uh, um, uh, uh, emblem, if you like, the Friends Meeting House. Uh, that described what it was, um, and it isn't anymore. And I, I can't see anything particularly historically significant in the narrative uh, that uh, there has to be a, uh, a display that says Friends Meeting House. Um, it's had different functions. And it's no longer that function. I think if, if toppings, um, they have a bookshop, but they, they need to make it clear to people passing by what this building is. And I think if Friends Meeting House is still shown there, uh, still depicted there, it would just lead to, com to complete confusion, especially for uh, visitors to, to Bath that um, wouldn't, um, wouldn't be familiar. Um, it has had nine paint schemes in different styles. Um, we're not talking about something that's been constant. And if you have a board over the top, well, what, um, you, you, you saw you wouldn't be able to see uh, what was underneath uh, and it might actually make it more liable to uh, deterioration if, if water gets behind. Uh, I, I, um, uh, I think what's being proposed is, is, is tasteful uh, and is appropriate um, and if the colours can be uh, a, a, a achieved through a condition uh, I would propose that we um, uh, delegate to permit. That's a motion I'm putting forward. Thank you. Okay, there's a motion to delegate to permit. Is there a seconder for that? Otherwise, I've got um, Councillor McPhee is seconding. Do you want to say anything on your seconding? No, I, I too uh, um, um, agree with uh, um, Councillor Housel. Nothing to add. Okay, uh, next then speaking in the debate is Councillor Rigby. Thank you, Chair. Um, like Councillor Hounsell, I was very impressed with uh, Councillor Craig's ward colleague, uh, ward councillor's um, input. Um, I think what I'm feeling is that I'm really disappointed this is at committee. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate all the work that's been done um, on probably the bigger bits in terms of uh, the, the, the compromises and the work that's had to be made to bring this building back into use. Um, and it feels to me very sad that on something like signage, um, we're now in this position where there hasn't been an agreed position between the, um, the applicants and the officer. But setting my, my disappointment aside, um, I, I absolutely agree that as a commercial entity, toppings need to um, promote themselves. 
uh, and that York Street, given the way it, uh, it currently is, I think actually having a lot of tables and chairs out there will encourage more, more footfall. Uh, and I was certainly very impressed by the thought that the, the doors will either be open or, or when the shop shuts, they will still be open and people will be able to see inside that it's a shop. I think that will indicate very clearly to the passing trade that this is, in fact, um, a bookstore. I, I do disagree slightly with Councillor Hounsell on the um, relevance and benefit of ghost signs. I think they're a very key and important part of Bath because um, what, what it indicates is that um, there is a past, but we're also moving forward. So I absolutely don't think everything should just be preserved in aspic and not move forward. But the thought of painting over a sign does give me a lot of pause for thought. I'm, I, it's not something that sits very easily with me at all. Um, I'm going to listen to the rest of the debate before I make my mind up about which way I'm going to vote. Um, but I am incredibly saddened that it's got to this on the signage when everything else was agreed, because I cannot believe that there wasn't a proposal that would be suitable for everybody to, to sign up to. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Thank you very much. I was, of course, going to propose that we support the officer's recommendation for the reasons that the officers have given. And uh, if this uh, motion that's on the table now falls, I shall propose the opposite. That's not um, because I want to preserve everything in aspic or anything like that. Um, but this is a landmark building. There's no two ways around it. It has a very long and interesting history. I would hope that Toppings would be stocking a very good collection of history of Bath books, antiquarian books and so on. Um, they are, of course, very close to the Abbey Bookshop, which presumably will reopen. Um, but there are other things that you can sell besides religious books and biographies and the sort of things that the Abbey Bookshop normally sells. So I don't think, I think actually that's quite an important point that you're going to get a syner synergy between having the one specialist bookshop one side of the Abbey Courtyard and then having this one over here. And I'm sure they'll all be very friendly and refer each customers to um, the opposite bookshop when they haven't got whatever it is that somebody wants. However, we are in the 21st century. We are in COVID measures. I think that people buy their books over the internet and if, and that, you know, their whole website and everything is extremely important and toppings can be extremely useful as having a depot there where you can go and collect your books or order your books from. And I would hope that something will be done by our friends who have the powers in this field to get the broadband widths and the IT connections in the region of the guild or where it's appalling um, greatly improves so that indeed we all want to see the small businesses flourish. I was very excited when I heard that Toppings were going to move into this building, actually, because I have never been to their shop because being disabled, I cannot manage to climb the hill to their present building. So, you know, this is wonderful. I shall be in there as soon as the ribbon is cut on the new buildings. But going back to this IT phrase, people wander down York Street looking at their apps, their iPads, their gadgets. They do not look up. And I think that, you know, there's going to be unnecessary damage to a landmark building uh, in the interests of mammon, as Jesus would say. So I'm going to vote against the present motion. Very, very reluctantly. It's a wonderful venture. Um, and the more we can do to support it, the better. But not by obliterating vast history. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Yeah, I must admit, I, I agree with Eleanor. I think, um, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great use of the building. I think it's um, a, a great project. Um, and my only concern is doing is, is any check irreversible changes to mm -hmm. the nature of the built the historic nature of the building, and I just think it's very sad that and disappointing that uh, toppings aren't prepared to negotiate on this because there are a lot of alternatives that could have been used here. Um, I think you know the the, the signage that that exists rather than removing it, should be brought back to its former glory. And I think that could be a, an asset for them rather than a, an issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Clark. 
Yes, I guess um, I'm uh, I'm a bit of a field, so I'm, I'm I wholeheartedly admire and support Topping's uh, venture uh, in these uh, days of the internet and Amazon and so on. So I, I wish them well, with, and obviously they're doing well from what I can see in Edinburgh and various other locations. But I'm um, disappointed in their own lack of uh, confidence in the unique selling proposition that they will bring to Bath by being in that, uh, in that unique place. Um, and that they haven't engaged in the conversation with the officer and have steadfastly uh, stuck with um, <clears throat> what I regard as uh, totally uh, unsuitable signage. I do agree, I think, with Sean and Eleanor along the lines that uh, they should be um, pleased and privileged, and we're pleased and privileged that you uh, want to have that uh, uh, site as part of uh, your hopefully burgeoning book empire over the next few years. But you too have a, a, a privilege and a duty to the people of Bath to actually look after the buildings that you're occupying when you, when you go into building of such importance and I think that you can uh, ensure that people come to Bath and come actually make their way uh, to Toppings as a place to go. Uh, for many years uh, I just make the point that my office was in a place called Manette Street. I was associated with rock venues in London and Dublin and my office was right opposite Foils. Now I know Foils is, is world renowned and they may well be in a, 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 a busier place in those days, although at the moment it's a bit of a ghost town. But nevertheless, people made their way. Foils, obviously, over a period of time, uh, became known throughout the world. And people made their way there, irrespective of any signage there. Uh, as I say, my office actually overlooked uh, and looked into Foils. Um, and also, in the, in the particular rock venue that my office was over, Nobody would know the borderline was there unless you would sort it out. So I think you should have a lot more confidence in what you're creating. And in, on the one hand, uh, in your own ability uh, and the, uh, the proposition that you're offering, I think people will seek you out. Um, I, I'm, I, I think you're going to be outstandingly successful, but I, I cannot support your application here at the moment because I, I am rather disappointed that you haven't come up with signage that's uh, more in keeping with Bath. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take Councillor Hodge and then Councillor Davis and then uh, ask Rich to speak before we go to the vote. Sorry, so I, I um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really broadly speaking in agreement with the last um, three speakers. I was very grateful to Councillor Craig for setting out the challenges for York Street, which I know well, it is quite a dark street and, um, but I feel the same way and I, I, I feel very positive that Toppings is coming to this site. I love Toppings. I, I, I think it's going to be, I think it will be successful in this site. I feel this is just the last um, stage in a, a process that they're going through. If this application is refused, it doesn't mean, um, of course, it's, it's not the end of it. You know, it's, it's fairly straightforward to come back with a, another application. And I feel we, it, we should get right the signage with this landmark building and I, whatever the, you say the narrative of the portico freeze, I think it should be there um, um, in some way to be retrievable, you know, that that past history of the ghost signs. And if, if, it's, if there's a way to put something over it rather than paint, um, paint it out, I, I would prefer to see that. So um, I really hope, I would like to see an application come back that we, um, I personally feel, um, happy about with the signage. Thank you, uh, Councillor Davis. Reflect much of what the others have just said. Um, I just think this is not the quite the right signage for the uh, building as it stands at the moment, um, but hopefully they can come back with the right uh, signage if it's, if, this, uh, if it's not approved. Okay, uh, and, and I have to say from my own point of view, I, I am concerned about the painting over on the portico. Um, I, I could have potentially supported you on the uh, eyeline signage. I think eyeline as people walking down the street, I think somebody somebody else alluded to, you walk down the streets, you don't often look up, but to look up and to see a, a block of color in an architecturally convenient point, for me, you're starting to going down a, 
and not necessarily in this case, but you're heading down a disignification of Bath's architecture. And I, and I know there's rules about colours and things, but I, I just don't, I, I just don't think, I, I, it's very, it's very uncomfortable for me. So I will, I can't support the motion. Uh, Rich, did you want to qualify, um, say anything before we clarify? Yeah, it was just to clarify, uh, I guess, really the, the ghost signage question um, and considerations around ghost signage, because that has popped up a few times in the discussion here. I don't think that this is necessarily what we would consider to be ghost signage in the conventional sense, which is usually a historic sign of a, a business that may have existed in the past that has faded to a point where you get you get that sort of glimpse of what it was, but it's not um, it's not stark. Uh, the signage the, or the wording of the Friends Meeting House in this case, in its current form, appears to have been possibly early 1980s. Um, so it's it's not what you're seeing at the moment is not the historic painting of that. And I think it's it's confirmed in the report that the uh, it may have been painted seven times, I think, uh, or there's evidence of, of up to seven times in there. There is a photo in the supporting information with the application from the 1920s that shows a painted frieze saying Friends Meeting House. And I think it needs to be looked at in the context or the consideration around the sign itself it needs to be read in the context of it's been a historic sign as to the use and the function of that building, which dates back to the 1860s. So it's it's reflecting a long term history of that building through the point of listing and up to the, the modern period. But the sign itself as a physical entity is not necessarily the historic thing. Um, so I think it's just making that distinction between it. I don't think it's necessarily a ghost sign in in the way that we would normally consider ghost signs, yet it is still a sign of historic significance to the historic context of the building. Um, so I think just in terms of weighing that significance and potential loss um, and, and the potential harm coming from that, the recommendation is that the, the harm um, or the benefits don't outweigh the harm to that. And uh, it is less than substantial harm, but great weight needs to be given to that. Um, I think, well, we see how the vote goes with all the motion and the, and the vote goes. Um, but if it's um, if there's going to be an overturn of the officer recommendation, I think the committee needs to determine whether there is no harm um, and then that the, the relevant considerations are not triggered. Or if there is still less than substantial harm, what are the great weights to override that harm? Um, so I think you just bear that in mind as we go into the vote and we'll, we'll see how the vote goes from that. But hopefully that clarifies the signage point. Okay, are, are we okay to go into the vote? Oh, oh uh, Councillor Hounsell is withdrawing his motion as he feels it will it will clearly fail. Uh, Councillor McPhee, you seconded, are you happy to, are you happy with that it's, it's been withdrawn or you accept it's been withdrawn? I, I accept. You accept that it's been withdrawn. So, Councillor Jackson, you said you had a, an alternative suggestion. Yes, I will propose that we accept the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Do I mean, I that we, we refuse the application on the grounds that the officer has given. Uh, and uh, I second, Councillor Rigby. Yeah, oh, uh, sorry, Clark, uh, Councillor Clark. Councillor Rigby, were you seconding there? I saw you first, yes. Um, so, uh, we have a, a motion to accept the officer's recommendation. Uh, to refuse the application for the reasons given. I'll go in reverse order. Uh, Councillor Rigby. Four. Councillor McCabe, four. Councillor McPhee. Again. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Four. Councillor Hughes. Four. Councillor Hounsell. Against. Councillor Hodge. Four. Uh, Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Craig uh, is abstaining herself from the debate and the vote, and Councillor Clark. Four. So I, I make that, Marie, is it seven in favour? Seven in favour, two against. I think you need to still take another vote. Two. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's on the planning application then, and the listed buildings consent. Um, uh, I'll go the same way again, Councillor Rigby. Sorry, Councillor McKay, can I just clarify, that was yeah, yeah. the vote on the... It, the two applications, it's not a planning permission, it's a listed building and an advert consent. So that was, oh, the, advert, that that was, was the vote on the listed that, building consent. Yeah, that was the advert consent then. Uh, that was the, the advert list, consent, okay. Yes, and we'll now do the listed building consent. Uh, Councillor Rigby. 
Um, just to be clear, um, have Ellen and I seconded both just before we do it? Oh, right, yes. Councillor Jackson. Um, yes, I was waving my hand. Proposing both. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Rigby seconding both. Although, uh, do you mind if I take Councillor Clark? Because he nearly got in there. So, Councillor Clark, if I can take you as seconding the list of buildings consent so you don't feel left out. Thank you. Uh, in fact, we'll go, in, we'll go in alphabetical order. So, this is the list of buildings consent to accept the officer's recommendation to refuse. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Craig is abstaining herself. Uh, Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Hodge. Four. Councillor Hounsell. Uh, abstain. Abstain. Councillor Hughes. Four. Councillor Jackson. Four. Councillor McPhee. Against. Uh, Councillor McCabe. Uh, four. Councillor Rigby. Four. So that's seven in favour, one abstention, one against. Is that correct? Yes, you're not. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so the decision there is to uh, accept the officer's recommendation to refuse. So um, hopefully uh, we will see something else come back that is more akin to what we'd like to see. Uh, so we are now, uh, if there's no further business, we'll now break for lunch. Uh, 40 minutes for lunch. So if we can come, it'd be back by five past two, please. I passed it. See everybody after lunch.
Welcome back, everybody. Shall I do a quick, quick roll call? We got uh, Councillor Clark. Present. Yes. Councillor Craig. Yes. Yeah. Present. Davis. Yep. Yep. Councillor Hodge. Yes. Present. Councillor Hounsall. Yes. Present. Councillor Hughes. Yes. Yeah. Present. Councillor Jackson. Present. Yes. Councillor McPhee. Present. Very good. Me, yes. Councillor Rigby. Present. Okay, we are all here. Welcome back after lunch. Uh, sorry for the slight delay for the next item, people. Uh, we, uh, we just overran slightly this morning. Uh, so can I just uh, remind everyone to switch off uh, audio and video? That's for public joiner joining us. Uh, and ask the Democratic Services Officer to remind everyone of the public speaking procedure. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the public and parish councillors have registered to speak about individual planning applications on the agenda. Ward councillors not on the committee have also indicated they wish to speak about applications. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentation about the application. The order of speakers and the time allowed for speaking will be as follows. Objectors will be to an application will be allowed three minutes in total. Supporters of an application will be allowed three minutes in total. If there is more than one objector or supporter of an application, they must share the three minutes allowed to each side. Ward councillors not on the committee who have indicated they wish to speak about an application may do so for a maximum of five minutes. I will time the speeches and inform the chair using the chat function when the time is up. The chair will then ask speakers to immediately conclude their remarks. After making their statement, speeches will speakers will remain in the meeting so that they can observe the debate. However, they have no further right to speak and so should mute their microphone and switch off their video. Once their item has finished, speakers will be removed from, removed from Zoom. Thank you very much. Um, item six on the agenda has been withdrawn and will be back with us uh, in the April meeting. So we move on to item seven, which is 143 Carlton Road, Lincoln. And can I invite the case officer, Isabel Dayon, to present her report, please? Thank you, Chair. So this application relates to 143 Carlton Road and is for the erection of two townhouses following the demolition of an existing one bedroom apartment. Um, there is a verbal update for this application. Uh, additional comments were received after the publication of the committee report and are recorded in the published update report, which has been circulated to members. However, further additional comments have been received from third parties since committee briefing. The comments have been uploaded to the website. The comments include an expanded shadow analysis commissioned by local residents who live in St. Mark's Road to the north of the application site in support of their objection. The additional information includes an expanded summary of the rooms which could be most impacted by overshadowing as a result of the new dwellings. The additional information does not raise anything fundamentally different to information and comments which have already been presented on this matter, and the issue of overshadowing is already assessed in the officer's committee report. The additional comments do not alter the recommend recommendation being made to the committee. For clarity, the shadow analyses from both the developer and the third parties will be shown in this presentation. So moving on to the site itself. So this is the site location plan. The site relates to the, the edge in red here. And then on the aerial photograph, it's this bit here, getting around it with my mouse. This is Colton Road. This is going up into Alexandria Road. <coughs> so we have the existing proposed site plan. Um, so this this here is the is the uh, apartment which is to be demolished. This is the uh, adjoining uh, apartment which will remain. This is the proposed site plan. So you can see the outline of one of the townhouses here, and the outline of the adjoining townhouse here, and the existing other apartments over here. So the existing floor plan on the ground floor, you've got a living dining area, and then on the upper floor more living space. 
And then the first floor is the roof of the apartment building to be demolished. Uh, the apartments next door go up to a first and a second floor. Here we've got the existing elevation. So it's this part here is the part of the site which is to be demolished and rebuilt as two townhouses. Uh, this building here will remain as, as it is. And then we've got an existing site section, which is quite useful because it shows the uh, level change. This, this site is, is located um, on a hill. Uh, so down here, it shows you where the section is, is viewed from. Uh, but this is the site here. And then you have a retaining wall, which borders the site and the end of the gardens. Uh, these are the properties here on the St. Mark's Road. Um, and then these are the properties on Coulton Road above, above the site. So you can see there's quite a significant change in level. So moving on to the proposals, we have a uh, basement area for each property, which has got a storage area, which could be used for the storage of bicycles. Um, and then the ground floor living space. And then the first and second floors have the bedrooms and bathrooms. And then the proposed elevation, so it's two townhouses just in here. This is the front elevation, and this here is the rear elevation. And then we've got the side, east and west elevations and a section just so you can see the different floor levels inside the house. This here is the existing retaining wall between the uh, neighboring properties to the rear on St. Mark's Road and the proposed site. And then again, a site section, uh, quite useful for seeing the level changes and obviously the increase in height of, of, of the buildings proposed compared to the buildings which are there at the moment. Um, again, the retaining wall of properties on St. Mark's Road. <coughs> so some site photographs, this is the approach up to the site along Colton Road. And then this is as you get to the site. So it's this bit just in here. And then a bit closer up, you can see the existing frontage. Um, the existing sort of front doors open onto, onto the highway. There's a small kind of um, pavement area outside this door here. <clears throat> and then just a few more shots of the frontage so you can see what it looks like within the context. And then these views are taken. This is the edge of the existing building. These are the properties here on St. Mark's Road, the rear. Uh, this property is taken. Uh, this picture, sorry, is taken further along, along the road, just so you can kind of see the rears of um, the pocket and window placements which they have. <clears throat> then again, this is taken slightly further up the hill, so you can see the whole site in the relationship with the uh, apartment building next door. It's this bit here that will be demolished. And then these are some photos from a uh, property which I visited on St. Mark's Road, number seven. Um, and the residents kindly let me have a look from the garden area. Um, so this is looking up towards the site. You can just see the gables of the existing buildings up here and the existing um, flats here. And then you've got the retaining wall. And again, this is from the terrace area and inside one of the windows, just so you can see that viewpoint of the existing building here and the existing uh, kind of flat building next door. Um, there is a, a significant level change between these properties um, and the gardens, obviously the, the retaining wall is quite sheer. Um, so this, this slide here shows the shadow analysis which has been presented by the developer. Uh, these images present a snapshot uh, at a single time point during the day, so in this case it's midday. The top image shows shadow modelling in March and September, relevant to the spring and autumn equinox in relation to the site at present. And the bottom image shows the same months with the development overlaid, so you can see the difference in the shadowing. And then moving to this slide, which shows the winter and summer equinox in December and June, again with the existing arrangement on the top uh, row and the proposed development at the bottom of the screen. So as mentioned in the verbal update, third parties have also submitted their own shadow analysis and in the interest of clarity, this is shown here. The third party mapping shows the site viewed from the south um, and only shows certain months in the year, so it's not directly comparable data. 
The third party analysis shows three points during the day, uh, reading from left to right. So the top line shows the month of December at 9.53 a.m., 11.53 a.m. and 2.13 p.m. Uh, the second row relates to November and January uh, at the times noted on the screen. The third row shows October and February and the bottom row shows September and March. The third party shadow analysis confirms the information the council has already considered, but from a different context viewpoint and for more time frames during the day as the sun moves from east to west. The committee report has already assessed these matters in detail. As with the previously committed application, it is acknowledged that there will be additional overshadowing caused by the development. However, St Mark's Road is already overshadowed to a degree by the ex existing developments on Coulson Road, and as concluded during the previous application, the level of harm as a result of the proposed development is not considered by officers to be significant to a point which would warrant a refusal. As the proposed development is the same as the extant permission, in the event this application was refused, the developer can still implement the previous scheme, which will result in the same impact as what is being proposed here. Moving on to public transport, this is something that was raised in committee briefing yesterday. So I've provided two maps uh, from Google, which show the position of Bath Bar Railway Station and Bath Bus Station in relation to the development. So the railway station is about five minute walk from the site. Uh, the bus station slightly further, it's about a seven minute walk from the site. And again, something else which came up in briefing yesterday was the parking zone. So the, the proposal includes no parking um, and the site is within parking permit zone three. So you can just see it here in this red zone. Um, so this map shows the extent of the permitted parking zones. Then this one here, which is zoomed in a bit more, shows the kind of purpley bluey colours of where the um, existing uh, residence parking bays are. So this application is recommended for approval with the conditions su suggested in the committee report. Thank you very much. Uh, I switched off my eye. Um, I have some public speakers here. Um, first up, I have Teresa Hopper, who is speaking against, uh, and then Simon Chambers, <clears throat> the agent speaking for. So Teresa, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Thank you. OK, so my name is Teresa Hopper and I live in St Mark's Road, directly below the, uh, the, the proposed build, and I represent the residents. We understand that this application is for renewal of the existing consent. We believe there are compelling reasons for the committee to review the recommendation to permit. In response to the highly selective shadow analysis shown by the applicant in 2017, purporting to show that the proposal would have little effect on the light coming to our properties, we commissioned a much more comprehensive analysis uploaded to the website. This shows that during the spring and late summer autumn months, there is demonstrable and significant shadowing moving across the back of many houses in the road at different times of day, and particularly affecting the nine houses immediately below the proposed development. The shadow analysis submitted by the applicant therefore significantly understates impact on dwellings in St. Mark's Road. Given that the light to the rear of our houses is already at a premium, the proposal will have a disproportionate impact. We feel that pro the proposal was considered to be, I quote, at best borderline in 2017. It should now, in the light of this new evidence, be rejected. In addition, a number of issues previously raised need further consideration. These are four bedroom family houses. It is surely realistic to expect one car per household. There is no off street parking for these homes and the case officer's report states that these new householders will not necessarily have the right to obtain a parking permit. Won't this only exacerbate the existing local traffic and parking problems? There is no external off street store for bicycles, something the, court, the council normally insists upon. There is no external storage for refuse and recycling, highly undesirable. I wouldn't like to store a family's weekly refuse indoors for a week. Access to the front is directly from the carriageway. There is no footpath. This is surely an unnecessary hazard for future occupants. We are shocked that the highways department do not object to this potential danger. In our view, these factors demonstrate overdevelopment of a site that has already seen a succession of redevelopments and unauthorized uses over recent years. The sketchy construction documents submitted in response to the case officer's request makes clear how ill-considered this proposal still is. We suggest that this site is suitable for a single two-story dwelling that would enable off-street parking and storage for bicycles and bins. 
It would also enable the access to the house from the courtyard rather than the road. There would still be some overshadowing, but it would be significantly reduced. We have spent the last six years worrying about a succession of disproportionate proposals that the applicant has submitted in order to sell on this site, which we now understand he has done subject to contract. Another three years does not bear thinking about. There have been 30 or so objections to this proposal. At the heart of them all is the belief that this is a gross overdevelopment of a small site which will impact negatively on this family neighbourhood for years down the line. We would therefore urge the committee to reject this application. I've finished. Thank you very much, uh, Theresa. Um, now I have Simon Chambers. Simon, are you there? Yes, hopefully that's worked. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Super, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've never spoken to a planning committee for any council in such circumstances before, and I wasn't really sure where to start without really repeating everything that's gone on in, in, in the previous application. But it seems sensible to review the facts of the matter. And first, the current application is identical to the approved scheme. That permission is not only extant, but all conditional matters originally imposed have been discharged to your council's satisfaction. There is consequently nothing preventing my client commencing the approved development before May this year. And perhaps most fundamental of all is the fact that there has been no change in material planning considerations since the extant scheme was approved by your council's previous committee. Uh, and, and different interpretations by local residents are not a change in planning considerations. This matter has been brought to committee in light of Councillor Bourne's request, and th those matters are summarised in the officer's report. However, although though I obviously note there are still local concerns about the development, no matters have been identified which were not previously considered acceptable. I must repeat therefore, and I'm sure your legal advisor will be able to confirm, but unless there has been a material change in circumstances, it would be unreasonable for a council to arrive at a different decision. Indeed, in this case, the notion is perhaps a nugatory one in any event. Not only does the case officer's report make a comprehensive assessment of all the relevant issues afresh and arrives at the positive decision or recommendation rather that the development is acceptable, but it is also confirmed that if this matter is resisted, the development can be commenced before May. The Planning Act defines what constitutes commencement and it does not have to be a substantial act. The application before you, to all intents and purposes, simply asks to delay any such works until either my client or another purchaser has been able to achieve a full programme of works. COVID has impacted the ability to draw all trades together as part of a single build project, and hence the requested time extension, so that a quicker and more cost-effective build-out can be actioned. However, if it has to be commenced on a piecemeal basis, I'm instructed that that is what will happen. Extending the process in these regards, though, in my opinion, does not sit well with the COVID, uh, the climate emergency or limit local disturbance. It's, you know, it would be so spread out that it seems unreasonable to me. And therefore, in light of the officer's positive recommendation and the facts of the matter being identical, I hope this won't be necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh... And now ward, the ward councillor, councillor Alison Bourne. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Thank you, yeah. councillor. Okay, thank you. Right, 30 local residents and the Woodcombe Residents Association have objected to this application. No one has supported it. This is not because they would object to any development on the site. They are objecting to this development because it appears to define overdevelopment. Trying to cram two townhouses onto such a constrained site that currently accommodates a one bedroom flat will cause many problems during the construction period and will create homes with inherent limitations that will also limit the amenity value of a number of neighbouring properties. Specifically, these problems will include significant disruption during the period of development that will cause access problems to residents of both Carlton Road and Alexander Road, neither of which is suitable for many construction vehicles. Overlooking and overshadowing of properties on St Mark's Road with significant loss of light to several houses and their gardens 
in the autumn and winter months when light is at a premium. And the creation of houses that will dominate the skyline, whose front door opens directly onto a road because there is no pavement, where the occupiers will have nowhere to park either bikes or cars, will need to put their bins out onto the pavement the opposite side of the road, which will force pedestrians to walk on the road, which will have no external space and which will overlook neighbouring properties. Residents were extremely disappointed when a small majority on the planning committee granted permission for this development in 2017. Given the nature of the constraints on the site, it's perhaps not surprising that construction has not started. There was plenty of time pre-COVID. This resubmission is an opportunity to reconsider that decision and to encourage a more proportionate development that is more in keeping with and which will have less impact on the surrounding area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, questions for the officers. I, I, I'd just like to ask uh, senior officers for a clarification on uh, on what scope this committee has to come to a different decision to the last time. I don't know if Rich or Simon can make a comment. Thank you, Councillor McCabe. Um, it's a difficult one because you have got an extant planning commission before you and it's not like circumstances that we sometimes get where there's a similar application coming forward and this is a different iteration of that application. Uh, as Mr Chambers identified and as it's set out in the case officer's report, this is actually an identical scheme that is simply trying to, um, well, effectively extend the life of a permission that already exists, but they could implement this permission. So, in effect, if the council were to overturn the current recommendation, it would be inconsistent with the existing decision that's already been made. Uh, and it would be of no effect because the development can go ahead and would deliver the exact scheme that is in front of you at the moment. So you have to consider the scheme um, that is before you. Um, but a significant material consideration is that extant planning permission. And I think the one thing that uh, it is worth drawing members attention to on this, particularly if um, we were going to go if the committee was going to go down the route of a, an overturn is the guidance on costs for appeal i don't think we could sustain an appeal um again because there is this extant permission in place but one of the substantive grounds for costs uh, just reading the um the cost advice note substant uh, local authorities are at risk um of a substantive award of costs and the examples of the types of behaviour that may give rise to a substantive award of costs, one of the criteria is not determining similar cases in a consistent manner. Now, this isn't just a similar case, it's an identical case. And I think the council would be in a very, very weak position on appeal and on a cost, trying to defend a costs uh, claim against this. So yes, you, it is an application for consideration. Um, you can come to a different decision to the officer um, but I, there is a significant risk associated with that uh, and there's a significant fallback position and I think also we need to think about what's the actual consequence or outcome of refusing an application which they can actually develop in any event because the, the extent permission is still alive um, they've discharged the key relevant conditions and they could in theory implement that permission tomorrow and I think I can't remember if it was one of the councillors or whether it, or the speakers or whether it was Mr Chambers on behalf of the applicant uh, noted that the, the bar for commencement development is actually incredibly low. There's very minimal works that they would have to do to actually uh, affect a, um, an implementation of the, the approved scheme. So, um, yeah, I, I think those are the risks associated with this and, and that should be borne in mind when, when considering this. Does that clarify, Councillor McCabe? Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, Simon, did you want to add? Yeah, th thank you, Chair. I mean, really just to, to echo um, everything that Rich has just said, um, this is a very unusual planning application. It's not uh, very often or perhaps even not at all that we see um, an application for an identical scheme when there's already an extinct planning permission. So obviously that extinct permission is, as Rich says, 
um, a very, very significant material consideration. Um, and absent um, a change of planning policy or a significant change in circumstances since it was granted, um, it's, it's difficult to see um, how uh, a decision to uh, refuse um, could be sustained. And I'd, I'd echo Rich's comments about um, uh, costs uh, and so on. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions then, Councillor Rigby? Um, I think uh, part of my first question has probably been asked and answered, but I just want to make absolutely clear, because it's certainly my understanding, and I believe the applicant's agent said it, that there have been no change in any of our policies or supplementary uh, policy papers since 2017 is my first question. And my second question um, is around the, um, as you brought it up, Rich, um, around the thing about appeal. I'm, I'm confused now in that I thought I heard the applicant's agent say quite clearly that were this to be refused, the, the action taken would be for um, whatever minimal work needed to be done to claim that the commencement had actually happened. So could you maybe explain to me what, what why would someone appeal this necessarily when, as you say, they've already got extant permission? So those are my two questions. Thanks, Rich. Or, yeah, I think... or, or Isabel, sorry, whoever's... Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm happy to take that one. Um, yeah, on the first point, the, uh, and as Simon just said, I, I should have mentioned it when I was uh, speaking before. Yes, there has been no material change in uh, policy circumstance. We the, the previous application was considered under the um, placemaking plan policies, which haven't changed um, with this. There has been changes to the MPPF uh, in 2019, but not affecting the considerations surrounding this. So to aside from the, the date change within the end or the, the relevant date of MPPF that we refer to, the substantive policies within that are consistent. So yes, in a, we're on the same policy playing field. There's been no additional or other supplementary planning documents or guidance that would change the position that was reached in 2017. Uh, on the second point, um, appeals, I mean, it, the starting point is that they have got the extant permission, so and they could go in tomorrow and, and implement that permission, in which case it's then live forever. Um, the purpose behind this application is to grant more time to develop it, whether it's the current owners or it is to get in place the, the construction programme to be able to deliver it, mm -hmm. uh, which I think has been delayed in part COVID, there, there will be other factors uh, in play there, but there's nothing to stop them implementing that previous permission, um, in which case it's then live forever. So I think the risk of appeal in those circumstances is possibly lower than it might otherwise be, but it is still a risk that we've always got to consider when particularly when looking at overturning recommendation or if any refused application has always got that risk of appeal with it and I think in these circumstances that risk of appeal carries a greater degree of costs risk um, because of the specific terms of um, behaviours that give rise to costs so there's no guarantee in overturning a decision that an appeal would follow or the costs would follow it's is something that does exist as a risk. I think the real relevance to focus on here is what's the actual consequence of an overturn because the development will still or can still proceed um, tomorrow in theory with that previous permission. Okay, uh, Councillor Craig. <clears throat> Thanks, so one of my questions has been asked by Councillor Rigby, thank you. Um, Isabel, the, the, at the rear of the property, you referred to garden uh, um, gardens at the back. Are they gardens or are they going to be built as hard standing, you know, patio type arrangements? You just share the presentation again. I'll go back to the floor plan. Um, okay. We looked at this yesterday, didn't we? And it was um, the basements go right up to the retaining wall. I don't know you get. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So ex as existing, it's like a, a timber decking area at the rear. And then, yeah, on the floor plans, um, it's, it's timber decking again to the terrace area. So it's, it's similar to the existing. Um, but as uh, Councillor McCabe said, 
you've got the basement level right up to the retaining wall and the garden level on here. Um, and from memory, there is uh, a proposed condition on the um, for the decision notice, which uh, looks at the boundary treatment on the retaining wall. I can't remember the exact wording, but I think I think that's been recommended. Um, on the left, on the left there, is that a little fence? Is that is that the uh, on here? That's that's the edge of the garden area, is it? Some yeah. So there is a small. Well, it looks like a small kind of. Um, fencing area here but obviously this this is the retaining wall that's shown on the on the other side okay so sorry can i come yep, yep. Yeah. Other, please so so there have been no um direct policy changes since 2017 but what we have done is declare a climate emergency you know we'll be back in 2017 now for what it's worth i would be saying no to this i think it's overdevelopment there's no greenery whatsoever around the buildings nor will there be by the looks of this no space to two family homes no space for the car you know you could put one on here with a little bit of garden and space at the side for one car with an electric charging point, for instance, which would be a far better solution, but we are where we are. So my, my question is, um, uh, all of our applications now need to be looked at with a view to climate change um, and sustainability. What weight does that carry in this case? Do you want to take that one, Rich? Rich has just muted himself. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've just had a, it's, uh, my Zoom is just frozen on me. Uh, I missed the end of the question there. Could you just repeat the back of that, please? The end of that uh, yeah, it was what, what weight, the fact that we, although, you know, there, there, there isn't a policy in place, but uh, climate change and yeah. our, uh, climate emergency has to be um, weighed against everything that we do, including planning permission so what 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 weight does that carry in this case uh it, it is a consideration but i think the starting point is still what the current policies are uh, as you'll be aware the policy is currently going through uh, a review um the, the policies as written uh would predate the declaration of the climate emergency ecological emergency um so they don't i mean they they do incorporate considerations of climate change within them um, but they're not specifically related to that declaration made by the council um, so they have to be given the weight as they are written um, and I think in those circumstances Simon correct me if I'm wrong you'd you give weight to it is a material consideration the declaration but it's not a significant policy can planning policy consideration yeah I mean as, as far as I'm aware Rich I mean you'll you'll know far better than I do um, we don't have any specific um, planning policies about uh, climate change at the moment um, and obviously the starting point is the development plan so the council's adopted policies and then uh, the next question is whether there are any material considerations which can potentially outweigh those policies so um, I mean my advice would be um, if you know if you were looking at any sort of climate change related refusal you'd have to be quite specific about um, what the uh, climate change uh, impacts would be that lead to a refusal obviously having regard to the fact that we have a an extinct permission from uh, 2017 I think it was okay, thank, okay. You. thank you can, can I just mention uh Councillor Clark has lost connection he's just rung me uh, Mikey we said he was trying to get back in but um he's struggling and uh, and as this is the last item uh, anyway I suggest if he can't get back in he, he doesn't try but he's he he is trying at the moment uh, next, Councillor Jackson. Yeah, obviously we have to take this application in its current context. The situation in 2017 was, as is very obvious, entirely different because I think then we would have, if the same conditions that pre prevail now had prevailed then, we would have a question mark about a development where it'd be impossible to have an electric car unless you're a disabled person, because you cannot park immediately outside 
the house because there are double yellow lines. And yet many people I know charge their electric cars by running a line into their house. You wouldn't be able to do that here. Um, I was wondering, um, I know I asked this question yesterday, but the others didn't hear the answer. Uh, if we can have a bit more of an explanation about the situation with regard to a parking permit and whether the householder here would be able to park anywhere remotely near the house. Because actually, I think that piece of grass in front of the house on the other side of the road is where the vehicles are going to land up. So uh, my question is, has the uh, situation with regard to parking, and uh, I mean, also we've got the question of, uh, I don't even call it livable neighbourhoods, but um, the council is quite rightly trying to uh, persuade people to walk everywhere. Uh, what is the, how much weight should we give to the fact there is no pavement outside this house? Um, I'll just share the screen again, so it's quite useful. So it was a very useful photo I remember yesterday showing this piece of grass. I went on the site visit, I remember it clearly. This bit. Yeah, that's the one you see. Okay, so this this actually slopes um it is quite steep, I know. Than it looks in this photo. I think it'd be quite and there is actually pavement along um this side just down there. So I think it would be quite difficult to obviously illegally would be parking um on this. Absolutely. Of grass. Um, in relation to stepping out um, onto the pavement on the floor plan, sorry, let me scroll back. With the okay. front door here, there is a small, this is a small recess. Um, so oh. the, the front door isn't uh, opening directly onto the street. There is a small kind of um, external porch, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, to avoid that, obviously it's not, you know, it's not large enough to park a car in or anything like that. Um, I'll just go back to the slide with the permit zones. Um, I don't know, Darren, if, if you want to explain a bit more about the permitting. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, as, as Highway Development Control Officers, we didn't raise an objection to the, um, the previous permission, which has, um, which has consent. And when we reviewed this one, we didn't feel that there was any um, any real need to change our, our advice. Um, I've spoken with colleagues in the parking services team, and they have confirmed that as the um, proposed two townhouses will be new build dwellings within an existing zone, they will not um, they will not qualify or be able to um, apply for any residence parking permits or any, any permits so anyone any future occupier who um, owns a car will not be able to park um, with a permit within existing parking zone three it's very close to a, a sky blue patch is that a, a zone two this area here or this no the other, that that there yeah I think from memory this is parking zone Four when I looked oh. at that earlier, but it is it's another it's another parking zone. Because I'm just wondering if the residents would go and park round the corner there. But I'm presuming you need a parking permit for that too. I would assume so. Is is that the case, Darren? I you you would do yeah. um any in, in order to park legally in any of the permit parking zones, you you do need to display a valid permit. Yes. Right. Okay, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, oh, well, I've got a couple of questions, but first of all, um, Richard, you're telling me that my starting point is that I have to accept the conclusions of a previous committee. Now, surely, if this is a new application, I should be coming into this with an open mind, not being, not being predetermined by something that's happened in the past. I wasn't on the previous committee, so whatever decision we made then shouldn't be influencing what I decide now. It's a new application. So, and, and I, I wonder, I mean, how many of the existing panel were on the site visit for the previous? The previous only, only two of us, I think, Councillor. So, 
I mean, I mean, maybe there's a justification for a, for a new site visit, seeing that uh, the majority of this panel weren't involved in that. Um, so I don't know if you want to advise me on that, Richard, or whether I should my, whether my decision has already been made by a previous panel. I think it is a really difficult position for the committee to be in because, yes, as you say, you, you have to come, you have to approach every application with an open mind and determine it on the, the facts of what's in front of you. Part of that consideration includes a consideration of the, the material substance of the application, so what it's applying for, um, the, um, the policy position and whether there's been any significant change from that. And any other material considerations and the, the significant material consideration in this is the extant permission now it's it's unusual i don't think i've ever come across a scenario where we've had to consider this situation where there is an identical extant permission because to a degree that does it does tie hands in the sense that it there's, there's no sort of uh logic to refusing it because the developer can just go in tomorrow and implement permissions so the usually you'd be if you're looking at an application afresh you would be considering whether there's any change in harm or or reconsidering the, the degree of weight that you'd give to that uh, and you might come to a conclusion that a previous lapse decision uh, that wasn't implemented um, with the passage of time and, and reflection is uh, is not acceptable and might come to a different decision and then they wouldn't have planning permission to, to implement. But the, the, it goes back to that point of the consequence of any decision made today has no actual bearing on the on the ground. The developer can go in tomorrow and and make that commencement. Um, so it's, it's entirely unusual to be in this situation. But that, that, uh, whether what the applicant can do tomorrow shouldn't influence mm. my decision today. I'm looking at the facts in front of me as new. I'm not, I, I haven't seen mm. this before. So, and, and a lot of these issues are subjective, whether I consider this to be unacceptably dominant and overbearing on the, on the properties below, for example. Mm. That's a subjective, the previous committee may have come to a different decision to me, but that doesn't mean that I can't come to a different decision today. Yeah, I, I just, Simon, did you? Yeah, I mean, Rich, yeah, um, just to, to, to add to a couple of points that you've said, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I do uh, do hear Councillor Hughes's uh, point that obviously he wasn't on the committee which made the original decision. Um, but obviously, in this case, um, obviously, that was a decision of, of the council uh, as an organisation. Um, so the council has made that previous decision. Um, and that previous decision and the reasons for it are obviously very uh, strong material considerations. And Councillor Hughes is absolutely right that it's still there is still a decision to make today, and um, members have to be open-minded, um, of course. But um, uh, it, when you're making a planning decision, um, you have to to do that um, in accordance with the development plan um, and any other material considerations. This previous permission is a very strong material consideration and if you wanted to depart from it as we've said already you would need to identify um, some sort of material change in planning policy or a material change in circumstances since the previous decision if you want to to um, make a different decision which is defensible thank you okay so so Isabel my second question is Assuming these are four, two four bed family homes, and I think it's naive to assume that there will not be any vehicles, where, assuming the fact that they can't um, obtain parking permits, where will they park their vehicles legally? They would have to park outside of a outside of a permit zone on a on a street which wasn't permitted. Actually, I think the kind of conclusion of of highways in their comments and the assessment officers is that really it's because they're in a permitted zone it's at the developer's risk to have to sell these family homes without um parking attached to them so yeah i mean if they did have vehicles they would have to park their cars outside of the permitted zones you know in in you know, not on double yellow lines etc in a lawful in a lawful place okay thank you i can Hansel. Um, I, I think my question has been answered in, in the chat. It was um, just an observation that the 2017 uh, decision had a condition that gave it a life of three years. And so I just asked the question, uh, how can the permission still be extant? Uh, but I believe one of the, le the uh, legal officers uh, 
can explain that there has been an extension because of COVID. Uh, perhaps that uh, for everybody's benefit, that could be clarified. Thank you. Rich? Yeah, so the, the original planning, the, the date of the decision on the, just looking on the system here, the original permission was granted on the 19th of October 2017 and ordinarily would carry a three year implementation, which is consistent with the Town and Country Planning Act. Now, in response to coronavirus, the government introduced the Business and Planning Act 2020, uh, which came in July, July 2020. Um, and one of the conditions was that, that within that was that any planning permission that was like or was due to expire um, during 2020 would automatically be extended until the 1st of May 2021. Uh, I think it was the government's realisation that COVID had um, brought in or had an impact on the development industry and that some developments would lapse because they couldn't get people on site to actually commence them so it's um it's by virtue of that um additional act that came in last year so, so yes from our point of view it is still an extant permission uh albeit it would have expired in october of last year Councillor McCabe, I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry, uh, Councillor McPhee. <clears throat> well, I, I do find it, uh, as uh, with Councillor Hughes, very frustrating. Um, um, and it seems to me one thing that has changed is the committee's changed. And also, you've got to ask yourself why you're setting those limits in the first place, the three years. Does it have any meaning? if everyone can simply put the identical one up and ask for it for another three years. So for it to have some teeth, I think we ought to be thinking about changing, changing the rules there so that it has to, if, it's, if it is com not completed, then it, it's gone. However, if, if we take that view that we should put all of that business to one side and look at the case, have we got enough? Is there anything really tangible when we revisit it? And my conclusion, listening to the questioning and listening, is that there isn't enough there for us to make a strong case in in the face of the uh, opposition that we will uh, get from the officers and, and from the, uh, the agent. So my conclusion is we're going to have to let it go forward. Um, we appear to have moved on to the debate. Were there any I more questions? I beg your pardon. <laughs> well, is there any more questions for the officers? I've got Lucy, were you, were you a question? More debate, I suppose. Hang on, let's just see. Was there anybody... Uh... Uh, debate. Uh, okay, we are we are moving on to the the debate by the looks of it. So, Councillor Hodge. So, um, I suppose I'm kind of going to disagree with Hal slightly, and I want to build on what um, Councillor Hughes and Councillor Craig have, have said. Um, also, I wanted to start with what the officers have um, said about something being pointless because A might happen or B might happen. You know, A the agent might start to build, but they might not. You know, it's March and they've, they haven't decided to do anything now and they've got until May. So how can we, and they may or may not decide to appeal. But I think what is, what is really important is the climate emergency. That has changed. We've stated that. It's a, this um, committee has a different set of priorities and we might take a view. There was a bit of green space there. One of the comments was green space create a semi-rural feel in this area that bit of green space is going to go, we might have a different feeling about that. And I think we should be allowed to express what our view is on, on this application and not worry about whether um, what may or may not happen in relation to the other two points. Um, and we also might take a different view about some of the amenity considerations as well. But I think the climate emergency and declaration of it is, is a, is a big change, that's a council policy, and um, we're giving more weight to those policies within the policies that, are, that exist. 
So I, I think there is a case for us coming to a different conclusion. Okay, uh, Rich, you wanted to clarify the time limit for commencement questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah, it was just a uh, council fee. What, what, uh, what normally happens? What normally so normally happens? It's, it, when... it stems from um, and the bit that I just picked up on was the, the question of uh, changing policy around that. It actually stems from the Town and Country Planning Act, Section 91. It's, it's um, enshrined in statute that all planning commissions uh, will carry a uh, three year time limit for commencement. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't carry limits for completion um so it's not something the council under certain circumstances can impose reduced time scales but the, the statutory position is set out in section 91 of the town and country planning act so unfortunately it's generally not within the council's gift to um to change that to, through through policy unfortunately so just just to clarify that point uh, okay um Councillor Jackson has a proposal. I do indeed. I mean, I've been obviously listening very carefully to the questions and I do have a lot of sympathy <laughs> on this question of climate emergency. Um, and it's not entirely clear to me that this building that they are proposing to erect in this planning application has the kind of um, insulation and um, what's the word, energy conserving types of measures that we might like to have seen or solar panels might, might actually be quite a good place to put solar panels on the roof. It doesn't have any of that. Um, but what it does have is that it is a vast improvement on the buildings that are currently on the site. Uh, I know I perhaps shouldn't refer to the fact that I was on the site visit, um, but from the photographs that the officer has um, produced in this admiral presentation, you can see that if those two very tired and worn down buildings are replaced, um, it will enormously improve the conservation area and the World Heritage Site and so on. It will just look that much better on the street. Um, I mean, I, I think it is a very serious drawback um, that there are the double yellow lines outside the front of the property but of course in working class areas in, in the last century and earlier it was quite often the case that houses rose straight off the pavement I've got hundreds of them in my ward um, you know with, without a garden or, or even a rail or I mean uh, you know you might want to put a toddler gate across that uh, recess in case you've got a small child who might want to rush out into the road um, but, but houses were built like that then, so it is part of the Bath vernacular. And so I think we should approve um, the officer's recommendation because this will improve the site. Now, I do take the point that it doesn't have anything green, and I do wonder if... Um, I don't really think that it would be reasonable, actually, to um, put a condition on about greenery, but you can do a lot with hanging baskets and... Um, living walls and patio trees and so on. There, there is an outdoor space that, well, if that were my house, it would soon look like a greenhouse. Um, so I don't think that that is a reason for not accepting this. I do think it is anomalous that we've got it before us at all because you've only got to literally dig a hole and that counts as starting work on a, an extinct permission. But they have decided not to do that. It, looks like they might be going to sell the site on. Uh, but I don't. I think the logical, reasonable thing to do is to accept the officer's recommendation, and that's what I move. Uh, right, uh, do I have a seconder for that? Have you got anyone waving at not me? Um, um, Councillor McPhee, I'm sorry, I can't see Councillor Davis. Uh, Councillor McPhee, I could see then uh, as a seconder. <clears throat> so just uh, carrying on in the debate, Councillor Rigby, Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm finding this really difficult. Uh, I think it was a great presentation by the officer and thanks all the officers for their um, answers to their questions. Um, I think I can say pretty clearly in my head, were I to be on the committee that saw this before, I would not be in favour of it. Um, and so what my what my difficulty is, is what to do best now, because I take on board that we have to be seen, obviously, to be consistent in our decision making. 
um, and that we I certainly don't want to um, open up uh, the council to any any uh, unnecessary costs. But on the other hand, I think I'd probably take slightly the, the, the opposite, the, the same side, the different side of the coin view to what Councillor McPhee said. In that I, I believe, and I hope I'm not putting words in his mouth, that what he was saying in effect was, well, there's no point voting against because it's there anyway. So, so for me, there's almost no point voting for because they could carry on doing what they're doing, but it would send a sign that this committee particularly didn't think that this was a um, an appropriate development in the space that it's it currently done for, for all the reasons that people have been saying up till now. So I am genuinely torn, and this may be a, a active abstention point for me because I can't in all conscience vote for this, this scheme because I feel it is terrible, but neither do I want to do anything that puts the council in a difficult position. Thank you. <clears throat> and there's not really a an option for us to say we are not willing to extend this for another three years, which is effectively what a permission uh, would grant. Rich, is that it's not really it's a it's a yes for three years or it's a no. I mean, a, um, a refusal. But uh, is it possible to frame it as we're not willing to to uh, we're not willing to to extend this permission because it's exactly the same application. We're not willing to extend it for three years. Is that was just not done. I, I don't think there's a mechanism to do that. I think it's either approve it or refuse it um, is the is the options. Um, unfortunately, yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame that the proposal on the table isn't a site visit because I feel that I would, I, with the information I have available to me. Um, is not the same level of, of information that the previous committee that passed this had available to them. So it's a shame that, that the site visit hasn't been proposed. That would have been a suitable way forward for me. Um, as it stands with what I look at, the information I'm looking at, I, I find this design, this I find it quite, it looks to me very overbearing and intrusive on the properties below. Um, I don't agree with the officer's uh, conclusion that it's, that it's it's not unacceptably dominant. I have serious concerns about the parking issues. There's a number of issues that I'm 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 that really concern me about this development. So um, so at this point, without a site visit, I can't I I can't support this. Yeah, Councillor Davis. I'm just going to go back. I think and uh, just check with Izzy one thing. Um, they said earlier about the putting in some green space, but I got a feeling the present place is is. Um, Decking now, there's no green space on what's there now, if I remember right. Is, is that what you said, Izzy? Yeah, it's uh, the existing plans. I won't show them again, but they show um, existing kind of timber decking and that that's what's proposed uh, next time. So there's not, you know, obviously there's there's less outdoors. There will be less outdoor space, but it's not kind of a change in it. It's not green now anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Councillor Clark. Thanks, Matt. It's just to, um, I, I may not have been noticed, but I actually uh, was sort of uh, kicked out for about five or six minutes earlier on when Richard would, uh, Richard Stock was first given it. So I've seen most of everything. Um, I've not joined in the debate because my understanding would be that because I've missed five or six minutes, I probably shouldn't participate in the debate and I won't be voting, but I'm just making that clear. Am Thank I you. correct? Nice to, nice to see you back there. Uh, Councillor Hounsall. Right, uh, just quickly, uh, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Jackson's point that uh, what's proposed is actually a lot better than what exists now. Uh, I, uh, I agree with Councillor McPhee, I just don't think there's enough um, to, uh, 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 to defend overturning uh, the permission that's already been granted in 2017 and uh, I, I certainly don't want to incur uh, costs for uh, the council uh, unnecessarily uh, so I, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation thank you thank you right I think we're, we're moving to the vote if there are no further comments um, and I think I shall be joining Councillor Rigby and actively abstaining i think there's so much wrong with this but um yeah anyway uh, so the motion is to support the officer's recommendation 
to uh, accept the application to permit uh, and we'll start in alphabetical order with Councillor Craig. Uh, I'm going to do an active abstention. I don't agree with it at all, but it seems we have no choice. Councillor Davis. I'll vote for. Or Councillor Hodge. Against. Against. Councillor Hounsall. For. Councillor Hughes. Against. Councillor Jackson. Actively for. <laughs> uh, Councillor McPhee. Sorry, for. Uh, Councillor McCabe, abstain. Councillor Rigby. Actively abstaining. Thank you. Uh, and Counterclock missed out, so he, he lost connection and the rules say he can't vote. So, uh, Marie, what was the outcome of that? That is four votes in favour, two votes against and three abstentions. So that's carried, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, so that is uh, all our applications uh, sorted. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, officers, we've avoided your difficult scenario of us turning that down. Um, uh, I have here uh, item eight on the agenda, Warminster Road. Members are asked to note the action taken by the Director of Development under Rule 3 of Urg the Urgent Business and Absence Procedure Rules regarding the defence of an appeal for the above site. Uh, has everyone seen that? Uh, you just asked to note it. it that we dropped two of the reasons for... I propose that we note it. I have no problem with this. Okay, lovely. I don't know if it needs a seconder, but uh, we're, we're just asked to note. Uh, policy development, we've got no items at the moment. Appeals report, uh, you're asked to note the appeals report, but does anyone have any questions or comments on the appeals report? Councillor Jackson. Um, yes, I don't like to say I told you so, um, but I rather thought we would lose the appeal on um, 231 Wells Way. Um, I don't know if anybody can just quickly tell us what the grounds were for upholding the appeal or if we could have that circulated. Uh, Rich or Simon, do you know the answer to that question? Not off the top of my head, but I can uh, arrange for it to be circulated um, thanks thank you A any other comments no <clears throat> in that case uh the date of the next meeting is wednesday the 7th of april starting at 11 11 again and uh there will be i'm assuming still a virtual site visit um which you will carry out rich and then that we will meet to to discuss that on the 29th of march Okay, thank you. So I formally close the meeting at seven minutes past.